Great. Thank you. Item four. All right, Mr. Best, let's get started. Welcome to the November 2nd Arlington County Transportation Commission. Our first item is citizen comment. We have no speakers for this item. Item two is the VDOT I-66 update. We have Amanda Baxter here from VDOT this evening. Amanda. Good evening. I'll like to stand here tonight, and if Richard could drive, that would be wonderful. Um, thank you for having me back. It's been a while, um, but a lot has been getting done on our delivery of the I-66 express lanes inside the Beltway. You can see more of the branding that we've given this project now. If you go to the next slide, um, this is just the overall program scope. Tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing to get ready for tolling. Um, our target date is December 4th, 2017, so we're about 31 days away from getting the toll system live and up and running. Um, I'm going to hit upon the multimodal projects that MVTC is delivering and then give you all an update of where we are in our procurement for the widening project. So this is the uh, express lanes mapping. Um, you can see here where um, we have um, tolling from the Capitol Beltway into Roslyn. Uh, right now we're delivering this project that we are tolling eastbound AM from 5.30 in the morning till 9.30 in the morning and tolling westbound PM from 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock PM. Oh, back one. Um, HOV2 is toll toll-free, um, and then the entire system will convert to an HOV3 um, toll-free when the express lanes outside the Beltway open in 2022. What we're really focused on right now is making sure people have their easy pass. You might have seen an article recently where through our testing, we can actually determine right now with the gantries about how many people are have an easy pass to travel the corridor. And right now we have about 50% saturation. I'm sure a lot of that is from the um, you know Dulles Toll Road coming off. Uh, a lot of people already have an easy pass coming off there. But we do have special user groups that have a lot of changes coming. That's the hybrid users that are no no longer um, exempt from the facility as an HOV user, and we also have the airport users that are no longer exempt. We've done a lot of outreach with those special user groups. DMV has sent two letters to those user groups, letting them know about the changes for the hybrids. We've also met with the airport council out with EMWA to make them aware that you know the entire um, you know working uh, Dulles Airport traffic that's rental cars delivery trucks taxis pilots we've gotten all kinds of different inquiries everyone needs an easy pass to be on this corridor during rush hour um, if you go to the next slide um, just one of the things I want to touch upon as far as our construction is concerned all of our um, 
construction for the toll system is complete. We did, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but we did take down a couple large DMS signs um, a few weekends ago that we're reinstalling before toll day one. There had to be some adjustments. One's right out here on uh, Glebe as you head out that really large um, uh, electronic sign, but those will be uh, reinstalled. Um, otherwise, um, we do have um, everything complete um, in about two weeks time, or next weekend, you're going to see a lot of signs go up and along down the corridor that's going to, to I guess, advertise that changes are coming. It's more of a campaign, um, part of our campaign to saturate. And then another thing that we're doing um, as of tomorrow, we have about uh, 10 to 11 park and ride lots, both VDOT park and ride lots in the corridor, Loudoun County, Fairfax County run park and ride lots where we have a big 66 express lanes campaign. So people know that changes are coming, get an easy pass. Um, and then the following week, we'll likely have the DMV van there so people can actually make exchanges for their easy passes. So we have a really large campaign. A lot of this is done 30 days in advance because Surveys have shown us, and we've done this twice before with 495 and 95, working with our private partner, that a lot of people make the adjustments about 30 days out before tolling. Um, and we're still testing right now. This is still testing in progress, and we'll probably do that um, all the way up. Where, you know, we're in the stages of where you know we're trying to break the system. What could go wrong? What we're trying to do. Um, Although we have a target date of um, tolling December 4th, um, we always have a plan B, plan C. Um, it is the time for snow. There has been snow December 4th. There's a lot of things that could change our go live decision, um, and we will be making those adjustments you know, on daily calls 10 days out before tolling to see if going live is appropriate for that. If you go to the next slide, um, this is a multimodal project. Now, this is the initial project that actually the Commonwealth invested in advance of the tolling. This is the $10 million program that's, that has been implemented, and you can see the status of those projects in these columns. This is the slide. We call that the commuter choice that is being managed and delivered by the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission. And actually, this program right here, this initial program we funded, um, MVTC reports that it will actually move 5,000 more people through the corridor um, just through this program alone. So they are actually implementing a round two call for projects right now. Um, they're using the same $10 million threshold since we haven't started revenue collection. But then every year, yearly, we'll, we will give them a revenue projection once the system is audited so they know how much revenue is coming in to spend on projects similar to these. Next slide. So tonight, um, one, one important thing that's coming up and a change that um, is underway to be implemented is our eastbound widening. And just to remind you all, it's a four mile widening from uh, two to three lanes beginning at the Dulles Connector Road to the Boston exit here, exit 71. We also have a lot of new and replaced sound walls that we're, we're constructing as part of that project. We have some off-ramp improvements at Washington Boulevard and Glebe. Um, we have the great uh, WNOD at grade, um, excuse me, grade separated crossing, the bridge um, at uh, Lee Highway. And then also delivered as part of this project, and I'll show you a high level snapshot of that, is the ramp to ramp connection that's actually outside the footprint of widening that we're doing at the Route 7 interchange. So just to go to the widening extents, next slide is, this just gives you a limit of where we're widening, the red line. Next slide. This is the actual design constraints we're actually working within. You could see that we have a lot of challenges. Um, we, our attempt is to do all of this within our existing right of way. Um, that includes um, the additional lane, all of our drainage, stormwater management. We are looking at a lot of pedestrian facilities over here. Not only are we building the new bridge, but the two existing pedestrian bridge that cross 66, we'll have to retrofit those in place. We're actually not reconstructing those. We're actually shifting piers um, to get the lanes in in those locations. Um, so you can see here just a whole um, consortium of things that we have to acknowledge when we design this road. If you go down to the next slide, um, you could see the types of approaches that we're taking to widening it. This project, uh, the, the, the actual majority of the project will be widened to the inside, and the configuration will be that we have two 11-foot lanes to the inside shoulder, and then the outer lane will actually be a 12-foot lane, and that could be um, for dedicated bus movement. Not only buses, but that buses can ride there in a little bit of a wider lane. But that gave us the flexibility um, to, to get this all within our right-of-way. Next slide. 
I talked to you a little bit about the ramp improvements that we're doing. This is the first one here at East Falls Church 69. This is the existing condition where you actually exit here in a one lane configuration. If you go to the next slide, you can see that we're adding the orange line on the top is the second lane that we're adding at that inter interchange, that ramp. And then on Fairfax Drive, we're actually doing a um, striping project where we're dropping a lane to better position people so that when they arrive at that intersection, there's more safer movements that occur and get, getting people in the right spots um, at that intersection and improve signing as well. And that's actually in the same location where the um, grade separation will be for the trail. If you go to the next slide, um, the same idea here, this is the existing configuration at exit 71. And the following slide um, shows the actual two lane striping that we're doing off there with some improvements to that off ramp. Um, in general, people do that somewhat today during rush hour, they try to get off the interstate, but this will definitely improve a more uh, um, stacking for those people that are trying to get off at Glebe. So 66 beyond this point can, can move more at a free flow. If you go to the next slide, this is just the last public hearing that our workshop, I want to say, for the actual bridge. This was the overall rendering that we showed um, for the grade separation. Now, this can still be modified even further. We're looking to hire a design build team to, to improve the, upon these aesthetics in coordination with the public. A couple of things that you see here that have been changed as part of the project, you could see the lighting across the bridge. That actually is not going to be um, in that manner. With the last workshop that we had, um, Nova Parks actually um, came to the table and said that they would maintain um, other types of lighting on the bridge, which is um, actually in rail lighting and footpath lighting that is a nicer aesthetic. The lighting that you see here is lighting that Dominion would actually maintain for VDOT since we don't maintain lighting. Um, but it really doesn't fit it within the aesthetics because our selection is pretty traditional and this is more of a contemporary style. So the rail lighting and the footpath lighting for that bridge will be a nice addition um, as we continue to refine this design. The following slide is actually the site plan for the WNOD. Um, again, um, this can still be adjusted based on our design builder. If people don't understand the design build process, we bring the design up to about a 30% completion stage, and then it's up to the design builder to finish that design. So there's lots of refinements that can occur after this. But the, the purpose of putting this in the package so the design builder not only knows that they have to build the bridge here, but they also have um, high expectations for um, landscaping and achieved aesthetics throughout the corridor. And you can see a selection of what we're doing. Um, another thing that we're adding as part of this is we're incorporating the elements that have been coordinated with the Arlington Historical Trust for the Benjamin Cole Trestle there. And you can see that we're implementing the site um, civil that they had approved um, at their previous meeting. If you go to the following slide, um, this is what I touched upon um, in the introduction. This might have been something we didn't present. This was done under a separate NEPA document outside the widening, but we're rolling it into this project. This is actually as you approach Route 7 heading eastbound on 66. One thing I want to point out with this is um, the reason for this, pro um, this improvement is that we wanted to provide a better connection to the metro here. When 66 was constructed, it was constructed actually as an HOV4 facility when it opened, and there was access to the metro wasn't necessarily important because mostly everyone inside the corridor, inside the beltway was already traveling at um, a very high carpool rate. What this does is it provides a ramp. If you see ramp W, on this drawing, that would be the new proposed ramp <coughs> that would connect the off-ramp to the existing loop ramp. So if you're going to the metro, you don't have to exit off now, make a right on 7, make a left on Haycock, make a left on Falls Church Drive to work your way back to the schools into the metro. You can simply just get off at that ramp-to-ramp -ramp connection, continue on straight to that more of that, that on ramp to 66, it also acts as a collector distributor because once you get on that, there's a little slip off ramp that can take you right to the metro. So this will be an improved access to the West Falls Church Metro for people that um, um, want to change their trip into a metro trip. And actually, we, we see here that this really improves the PM peak. This metro is highly used in the evening 
um, at this location. So this is a great improvement that we're introducing. I'm going to end with this. Um, next slide is our project schedule. Um, the multimodal pro projects are underway. Um, we are 31 days out from getting the express lanes open on 66. Uh, we are also doing a live opening tomorrow of the price proposals for the widening. So that will be a very high level look at who will be awarded this project. We have scored the technical proposals that have come in, so they have a score. And then we get a price proposal, and obviously the low price gets the, the best score. We combine those two scores, and then we award the project. So it'll be a first look at what team may, although the technical proposal scores won't be shared tomorrow, it'll be a look at who may be getting this awarded this project. And our, we anticipate taking this to the Commonwealth Transportation Board at their December 3rd, 4th meeting. Um, in early December to have them officially award it to the successful bidder. Um, construction will begin early next year for this project. We plan to continue tolling during rush hour, during construction, and the way that we work those plans is that traffic will be shifted three times during construction in order to set expectations on how we have the tolling calibrated. Um, Contractually, we have the eastbound lane for the project opening up in no on November 10th, contractually, 2020. They even have an incentive in the contract if they can get it, up, um, early, get it opened up earlier. The project itself um, in large is October 21, uh, 2021 delivery. And the difference between that is, A, having the travel lane open up in advance, so there's move, you know, mobility through the corridor. But then the other elements, such as the bridge, the sound walls, um, and other elements will then be um, happening around that time and then delivered um, the following fall. And that is my presentation. So I'd like to open it up to any questions. Do any commissioners have questions for Ms. Baxter? All right, thank you very much for your time. For having me. Our next item is item three, the Crystal House three site plan. This is a site plan in action. I'll turn it over to the uh, applicants uh, represented. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Allman. I'm with the firm of Walsh Colucci. I'm here tonight representing Rosalind, uh, the applicant for the Crystal Houses 3 site plan project. Get the first slide. Uh, just to briefly orient you to the site, you can see it in the middle of this slide uh, outlined in orange. This site is uh, very much in the heart of the uh, Route 1 transit corridor uh, adjacent to Crystal City. And if we could get the next slide, this will zoom in a bit. Um, here you see the two block site area of Site Plan 13. Uh, site Plan 13 covers the Crystal Towers block to the north uh, on the right side of this image, and as well as the Crystal Houses block to the south on the left side of the image. Uh, in 2006, the Arlington County Board approved a site plan amendment that combined both of these blocks under a single zoning approval and transferred excess density from the Crystal Towers block to the south to the Crystal Houses block. Uh, and that approved development consists of two buildings with a total of 252 units. Uh, and although it was approved in 06, it was never implemented, uh, largely due to the amount of underground parking in that approval relative to the amount of density. It was just never feasible uh, to build the underground garages for each of the two buildings uh, with the relatively low amount of density above. Uh, so the new plan takes the same amount of density and reconsolidates that into a single building footprint uh, with approximately the same footprint and height of the north loft building. And that's what you see generally outlined in red here. Uh, and We'll kind of show you that in a future slide, but the idea is to keep one of the two buildings in roughly the same envelope and take all 252 units and put it into that envelope. Uh, next slide. 
So here's the uh, ground floor layout of the proposed building. Uh, it's located at the corner of 18th Street and Ede Street. Uh, you can see that the building has two main lobbies, uh, one at the corner of 18th and Eads. We call this the Metro Lobby because we think that's where residents walking to and from Crystal City Metro will be most likely to walk in and out of the building. Uh, there's also a lobby uh, on the opposite frontage of the building near the private site entrance. Uh, that's on the left-hand side of this image. Uh, in terms of vehicular access, there are two entrance points. Uh, they're both existing today, and we're just proposing to reuse those. We're not proposing any new curb cuts. Uh, one along 18th Street and one along Eads Street. And you can see there's a private drive that runs around the back of the building. And what that does is it allows us to consolidate our loading, our trash, our service, and our garage entry internally on the site and keep those functions off of the public right-of-way. Um, just to quickly highlight a few changes that are a little different in this plan from what you may have seen when we first came to the Transportation Commission or in SPRC, um, we've modified the location and layout of the lay-by near the main building entrance. We think in the proposed location now, it'll be a little more functional for folks that are pulling in and, and need to make a quick stop right at that front entrance. Um, we've removed a lot of surface parking near the 18th Street site entrance and really simplified that design to try and consolidate uh, turning movements and eliminate conflicts in that area. Uh, we've widened the sidewalk along 18th Street in response to comments at SPRC from six feet to seven feet, and we think that'll be an improvement. Um, near the Metro lobby entrance, we have uh, tinkered with the balance of hardscaping and landscaping uh, to better uh, honor the natural uh, desire lines of pedestrians walking uh, to and from the site in that area. And then it's not quite shown on this slide, but you'll see it later. We've also removed quite a bit of surface parking on the uh, southern boundary of the park and changed the way that this internal service road loops around the park. Uh, and that was done primarily to save uh, some of the existing mature trees. Next slide, please. Uh, just very quickly to give you a sense of what's there today versus the proposed architecture. Uh, this top left image is the corner of the private uh, driveway entrance from Eads Street, and then the bottom right image is the view head on from Eads Street. You can see the what is today just a surface parking lot in front of an existing 12-story building. And then the proposed architecture from the same two vantage points the top left is that main lobby entrance near the park and near the uh, Eats Street entrance, and then the bottom image is that whole Eats Street frontage. And you can see how the architects have tried to work with dimensionality, uh, colors, massing, to try and break up uh, that rather lengthy facade. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague from Wells & Associates who will actually walk you through the components of the transportation study. Thanks. Hi, good evening. I'm Mike Minkowski with Wells & Associates. Um, we've completed the tra multimodal transportation study for the project. Um, the TIA for the project was originally done with the 2006 site plan, and they included a total of 10 intersections. Um, when the site plan was brought back um, in, uh, we coordinated with DES staff, and they requested that the five immediate um, previous study intersections be included in the update for this study. Um, the analysis showed similar results to the 2006 study, uh, as well as similar um, traffic volumes at, at the surrounding intersections. Um, <clears throat> in response to DES's review, we then completed a comprehensive multimodal um, section in, as an addendum to the study. Um, as Matt mentioned, we have 252 units. Those units are gonna generate approximately 36 a.m. peak hour trips and 44 p.m. peak hour trips. Um, with the development, um, the intersections are gonna to continue to operate at acceptable levels of service, generally consistent with existing conditions. And some of the improvements that are gonna occur um, that will come with the development, as Matt mentioned, uh, will be improving the streetscape along 18th and Eads. Um, as well as improving the existing traffic signal at the Eads 20th and private driveway intersection. 
Here summarizes um, all the existing multimodal facilities um, as far as transit facilities, excuse me. Uh, it highlights the bus lines in the area. Uh, there's four capital bike share stations within a block of the site, totaling 56 docks. Uh, and then there's also multiple car sharing opportunities nearby. Uh, and also highlighted on here from the Metro access is uh, it's a 700 foot walk across um, the Eads 18th signalized intersection. Um, there's pedestrian countdowns, marked crosswalks on all quadrants of the intersection. And then you're along the, the northern sidewalk to the Crystal City Metro. Vehicular access to the site. Uh, there's multiple points of access um, serving the property. These two highlighted here are the two closest to the proposed building. Um, Eads and 20th and the private driveway is a signalized intersection. 18th Street and the northern driveway there today is a right-in, right-out driveway. Um, the county has a plan in place to remove the median there and create new buffered bike lanes along that section, which will allow for full movement to occur at that intersection in the future. So this is a shot of the existing cross sections. Um, Curb to curb dimensions within the existing roadways are not going to change uh, in the future. As I mentioned, uh, there will be improvements on 18th Street, but the curb to curb dimension is not going to change. Going to the next slide, what you'll see is um, the 18th Street section here shown is with the removal of the median. And a highlight on the west side of the, or the left side of the, the exhibit. Um, the wider sidewalks that meet the sector plan minimums. Uh, on South Eads, it'll be a six foot sidewalk with a six foot landscape buffer. That's a plus three feet over the existing condition. And then along 18th Street, it'll be a seven foot sidewalk and a six foot landscape buffer, which is a 5% or a five foot improvement over the existing condition. Here summarizes all the pedestrian connections through the site. Um, and on this slide here, you can also see um, the improvements on the west side of the, or the southern side of the park. Um, previously, we had parking front in all the way down from where the pool is to the southern portion of the building along Eads. This design only puts parking closer to the pool and preserves all the trees and creates more of a buffer between the existing building and the driveway. Um, also, as this project is um, going through, we took a look at other locations, not specifically within this quadrant of where the new building will be uh, to, and look for opportunities to um, put new ADA ramps and new connections in. I believe there's two or three new ramps being put in. So here's a shot of the, a, a, a section, the typical section along Eads. It, it, it highlights the six foot planting strip and the sidewalk. And then the, you'll have a variation in the building zone depending on the stoops. Here's 18th Street and the private street. Again, seven foot sidewalk on 18th Street um, and private street will have a six foot sidewalk and approximately four and a half foot planning strip. These are the bike facilities in the area. Um, since this map was produced, the segment of Eads north of 18th is also has um, dedicated bike lanes now. Um, but again, you can see all the, the options for capital bike share and the, the marked uh, pedestrian or bicycle facilities in the area. So here is the parking and loading summary for the site. Um, previously, when we came, we had 40 additional spaces. Um, primarily, the loss in spaces was due to of what I mentioned earlier on the south side of the park and the reconfiguration of the parking closest to the 18th Street driveway. Um, that brings us to a total of 486 um, for, a, for a crystal house block ratio of a 0.91 and an overall site plan ratio of 0.97. Um, as far as bicycle parking, we'll, we'll meet the code requirement. Currently, we have 109 shown um, that includes 101 in a secure bike room on the P1 level of the garage, as well as four racks at each of the main 
lobby entrances. Here summarizes the on-street parking availability within a block of the site, um, excluding the six zone A parking and the four highlighted in blue for taxis. We have approximately 84 spaces on street available for the public. The TMP is going to include physical facilities improvements that include the um, bicycle parking that we just mentioned, streetscape improvements on 18th and Eads and traffic signal improvements. Um, there will be a commitment to a parking management plan, um, typical promotions and, poli and services, um, including smart trip cards for new employees and leasees. And, um, and there'll be um, performance and monitoring as well that'll be required. So that's, that concludes the presentation. So if you have any questions for us, we'd be happy to answer them. Does uh, staff have a presentation as well? Hello, my name is Joanne Gabor. I'm with DES, and I'm here to present the Crystal Houses 3. This is Site Plan 13. It is a major site plan amendment. The applicant covered this fairly well, so some of these I'm going to skip over in reference to time. Um, I think we all know where the site is. It is at the southwest corner of 18th and Eade Street. It's shown here in the solid um, white polygon. As mentioned, the site plan 13 actually comprises the two blocks. It's the Crystal Towers block and then the Crystal Houses block. So the block just north of 18th and the block south of 18th. And this is, um, the combination of this is another facet of the site plan 13 site plan amendment. Just to refresh your memory, the 2006 approval was two four-story buildings. It was originally approved with 247 units and then administratively revised to 252 units. There were a total of 588 underground parking spaces, and this was supporting some new spaces for the new buildings um, and then replacing some of the surface spaces. So some of the existing residents in the existing buildings would then park in the new garage. Um, this also would allow the lot just south of 22nd to be removed from the site plan, because currently that lot is used by some of the residents of the Crystal Houses um, complex. The applicant at that time also agreed to improve streetscape around the entire houses block, um, dedication of the streets. There also was a lead score of 26. And again, this is still active because it has been extended by the General Assembly. The current proposal, this is within the Crystal City Sector Plan. Um, they are maintaining the existing zoning of RA615. And as was mentioned, it's 252 units now in one building. So it's five stories with a 60 foot um, height. The parking ratio is 0 0.91 spaces per unit for the block and then 0 0.97 spaces per unit for the entire site plan. The applicant is targeting LEED certified and they are also providing a 31,600 square foot open space. The only modifications requested are for a reduced parking ratio, um, as mentioned, then a 28% compact parking ratio within the new proposed garage. And again, just to walk us through the streets, looking at 18th Street, they are maintaining the existing curb location. Um, the sector plan does call for a six foot minimum clear sidewalk. They are proposing a seven foot clear sidewalk along the building frontage. And this is again mentioned um, numerous times during SPRC due to the volume of pedestrians, they would like to see an increased sidewalk. And so that's how we know seven feet instead of six. This does meet all the Crystal City sector plan guidelines for the clear sidewalks and then the overall streetscape width. Um, as mentioned, there is a county project along 18th Street that will modify the travel lanes and this will include the buffered bike lane and the removal of the median that exists today. And this is from Eads to Fern Street. On South Eads Street, 
Um, it's a lot of the same scenario. They are maintaining the existing curb location, so there is no proposed changes to the street section. Uh, there will be a proposed six-foot clear sidewalk, and there are gonna be two small pinch points at the main lobby at 20th Street that do not inhibit the six-foot clear sidewalk, um, and the pinch point's about 0.5 feet in, so they don't have technically the 18-foot streetscape. It's 17 foot, five inches, um, but that entire area is paved, so it's not gonna inhibit or diminish anyone's ability to walk through there. It's um, more just something I wanted to point out. And again, there are these pinch points, but generally speaking, it does meet the Crystal City sector plan guidelines. The uh, proposed parking garage is beneath the proposed building. It's two levels. Um, the parking garage will be utilized by residents of the proposed the existing buildings, and it is to be accessed from the internal um, roadway system. I think we've mentioned the parking ratios a couple times, and again, there also the surface parking will be reconfigured a little, so some spaces are gonna remain, some will be restriped, and there is gonna be a little reconfiguration to have some new spaces um, based on the geometry. The bicycle um, parking, there are 101 residential spaces within the garage, and then the eight residential spaces around the site grouped at the corner of 18th and Eads, and then 20th and Eads. Um, and this does, again, meet the site plan standards. And then they do have loading docks, and they are accessed from the internal roadway as well. So in conclusion, um, staff does support this project with the conditions that are shown in the county board uh, report. A couple items to note is when I did this presentation, there was still some discussions about the installation of the in-building wireless. Um, since I crafted this, there have been more discussions with the applicant, and I'd say conceptually the applicant does agree to this, but we're still doing some um, looking into how it would play out in the building, so it's something that's still being discussed, um, but the applicant and the staff are both working toward a solution that will make everyone um, satisfied. There also was discussion about a public easement to permit mid-block access to the park from South Fern Street. This is something that in the 2006 um, approval, it was just by condition, and since that time, we are now looking more for an easement. It's something, um, again, since I put this together, the applicant is now conceptually on board with providing an easement, but there's some concern, and we wanna make sure the language um, works, so if there's some construction, or they need to make some changes um, internally to the site, that they're not gonna be, uh, they're not gonna be violating the terms of the easement. You know, so if they do some construction on a sidewalk for a little bit, you know, a couple days, so technically the access would be blocked for a couple days. It's something that we just wanna make sure that the spirit is there, um, but that the terminology and the language is written appropriately. And so that's something we're also gonna be working with the applicant between now and Planning Commission and County Board to make sure that everyone's on board with the language. But again, conceptually, I would say we're all on board with these two conditions, um, but the language does still need to be tweaked a little bit. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Bester, are there any speakers on this item? We have no speakers for this item. All right, thank you very much. Commissioner Weir, kick things off. Uh, Joanne, I have a question, I think, for you. Um, what is the high-level difference between um, blocking access to an easement for something like construction, as you mentioned, uh, on the one hand, and blocking a travel lane uh, to do construction when a building is being redeveloped on the other. I mean, in both cases, it's uh, we're talking about blocking off public access to something for the purpose of construction, right? That's correct. I wanted to, there we go. Oh, thank you. Okay, what am I doing now? I double clicked on it, I thought it was gonna come up. If you click that button. Oh, there we go, thank you. Um, so just to, so everyone can see what we're talking about is Today, so this is the 31,600 square foot park that will be dedicated. 
And if you can see, there's this, uh, we have these couple red lines, one at this location, um, then we also have one here, So, and also there's one here. So we are looking to have access through the site. Um, this is all gonna be, this is all on private property, it's not in public right away. So I would say the big difference is because this is a pedestrian access, um, and also it's private, um, so it's not impeding construction or walkability in the public right away. So the easement language is what we just want to make sure um, satisfies everyone. Yes, if like for the park easement, for example, we have some language in there that says you know portions of the park, and again I'm going to paraphrase, portions of the park may be corned off um, or closed temporarily for construction or utility upgrades um, or something of that nature. So we want to make sure that. Um, legally, any work can be done by the applicant that needs to be, um, but then we also have some assurance that it's not going to be corned off you know, for two years or something like that. Did I answer your question? To the extent that my question is fully fleshed out of my own mind, perhaps, I, it just, it seems to me that restriction of public access to uh, part of the transportation grid it happens all the time for the purpose of construction um, when it is a public right of way, um, and I'm I'm just wondering what what would make it hard to allow for restriction. I'm I'm just trying to I'm trying to understand if there's any conceptual difference between having an easement that can be closed off sometimes. Uh, on the one hand, and a public right of way that can be closed off on the other hand, it would seem harder in terms of, it, it would seem like a bigger deal to close off a sidewalk that's on the public right of way than so, it would to close off an easement that is already private property and the public has a limited interest in. So I guess the one thing um, also to note is if there are closures within the public right of way, then permits need to be obtained. So, you know, if you were going to close the sidewalk, you know, for two weeks to put in a gas line or something, you, know, you would come to the county and you would apply for a transportation right away permit, and then you'd provide a plan, you'd provide a maintenance of traffic plan, we would review it, we would approve it, and then you'd have a permit for a specific duration. Um, so in this instance, because this is private and it would just be easement, that's not something that the applicant would be required to do. Um, so this is really probably the only mechanism we have to have some sort of, um, you know, checks and balances, if you will, to make sure that a walkway easement through the site, uh, you know, is honored. I don't know if the applicant wants to add anything to that or not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Other commission questions? Commissioner Perkins. I had a question about the enhanced TDM that was going to be provided by the applicant. I believe in the um, staff report it says that there would be an enhanced TDM in the form of additional subsidy for car share, bike share, or transit. But the applicant's um, presentation appeared to mention like a one-time metro card or one-year uh, bike or car share membership. Is that what's... Um, it's that, is that what's intended? No, the condition does have our, if you will, standard enhanced residential TDM, which is the option of the car share, bike share, or Metro card with $65 of fair media for every unit less than one to one. In this instance, it's 94 units specifically, and that would be for 30 years. Um, and then obviously the benefit goes first to the folks that do not contract for a parking space and that would be offered to the other. So um, that's an ongoing rather than a once upon move in. That is correct. Is so there, there a is, si so there is a this site plan. Um, which site plan number is that under? It is. 41 is TDM. It's on page, it's the top of page 64. Okay. And it is 42 D. Two, one, two, the third paragraph. Okay, 
I'll read it and <laughs> see if there's any other question. Um, the other question that I have is what, can we look at the 18th Street, the uh, removing the center median for the, um, the movement? Is that gonna detract from pedestrian safety to have um, vehicles able to turn both left and right out of that, um, that driveway? That one, yeah. Oh. You know, you're not gonna get what you want. So this is very hard to read um, at this scale, but this shows the 18th Street plan. The driveway we're discussing is right at this location. Um, I would say the reality is that we have many locations where there are driveways that it's not just right in, right out. You know, pedestrians obviously need to be cognizant as they are crossing an active driveway to make sure that they're not going to get um, you know, any conflicts with cars and pedestrians. It's something that you know, we're looking at it from, we're introducing the buffered bike lanes. We are going to have some parking um, right along here. The bike share station is going to move a little. And then we are going to have the bike lane come across right at Eads Street so that the right turn pocket will minimize any conflicts with the bicyclists going through on 18th Street and the folks turning right on Eads. So it's, you know, it's definitely a balance, mm -hmm. um, but it's something that as a county, you know, the county, this is a county project that was in the works before this even came um, before us. Okay, thank you. I have, don't have any other questions. Uh, I brought up during SPRC um, the possibility that, or the opinion, um, that we should be requiring the applicant to upgrade the protected bike lane, lane along Eads. So we require them to make improvements to the pedestrian streetscape when it doesn't meet standards. We require them to make upgrades to the street trees when it doesn't uh, meet the sort of facilities that we're trying to install at this point. Um, and uh, we got some public comment via email yesterday um, to that same effect. Was that uh, considered or discussed with the applicant at all during this process? So it's something, um, so the buffered bike lane today in this location is about a mile long and now extends from 12th Street on the northern end all the way down to Fort Scott Street Drive. Sorry, I don't remember which one. Um, so it's about 16 blocks, it's a mile long, and it's something that, you know, from a county perspective, we did it as a pilot. It's something we're still looking at. Um, the county is definitely open to, in the future, maybe making some upgrades or some enhancements to this. We're still collecting data at this point because the bike buffered lane was just recently opened all the way up to 12th Street, so we still want to see how it functions, um, how much traffic there is on it, before anything is done. In terms of the site plan, we didn't feel it was appropriate because they only have two blocks of frontage. Um, and so we didn't want to have basically this entire mile minus two blocks having a different treatment. Um, so right now, as a county, we're comfortable with having the painted um, area and then the flexible bollards. But we're definitely open to upgrading this in the future um, and also looking at you know different um, techniques and ways to cord off the bike lane as new technology comes. And there's more data on, you know, what is the best and most appropriate way to do that. Thank you. Other commission questions or comments? All right. Um, I just want to say I, for one, feel like um, protected bike lanes that are protected by actual curbs, um, protected bike lanes that eliminate the uh, conflict with buses at bus stops um, are not pilot material anymore. They're NACTO endorsed. They have gone through multiple revisions. They are being installed in tons of cities across the United States. Um, and we don't say we don't want this sidewalk widened because the sidewalk one block down, you know, 
is narrow and we want consistency, we take the upgrades where we can get them and that's smart from a financial perspective. Um, and uh, you know, every little bit helps uh, from a bike, bicycling perspective. So I for one am disappointed in the county's stance on this particular piece of the development. Commissioner Hester. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to support language in your letter to the board after this, um, for this meeting to have language included in there to express those opinions. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have a motion or further discussion? I'm willing to, I'm willing to provide a motion. I move that the Transportation Commission recommend that the County Board adopt the attached ordinance approving an amendment to Site Plan Number 13 to permit construction of a multifamily building for up to 252 dwelling units with modifications for parking ratio and compact parking subject to the conditions attached to the ordinance. Also, I would recommend that we include in the motion uh, that the letter will express the Transportation Commission's support for enhanced um, bicycle and pedestrian facilities along 18th Street. Second. All right, we have a motion and it is seconded. Um, so that was um, the county manager's recommended motion plus uh, some statement about the letter. All right. Um, I'd like to offer an amendment to that motion um, that strikes your uh, section about language in the letter and adds directly to the county board's, to the, our recommendation to the county board that there um, add an additional condition to this development, that they upgrade the protected bike lane along Eid Street frontage to a curb protected bike lane that eliminates the existing conflicts between bicycles and buses as part of the streetscape improvements in consultation with county staff. I will second your amendment. All right, we have an amendment that is seconded. Is there any discussion on the amendment? All right, all those in favor of the amendment? That's unanimous. Any discussion on the amended motion before we vote on the final motion as amended? All those in favor of the motion as amended? All right, that's, that's it. Thank you very much. The next item is item four, the Washington Boulevard and Kirkwood Road special GLUP study and associated GLUP and MTP amendments. Anthony Fusarelli is here from uh, CPHD to give you a staff overview. Uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and uh, members of the commission, just letting you know in full interest of disclosure, my firm has worked a little bit on this project as well as um, exclusively in the project for item number seven. So in the interest of avoiding the appearance of um, any conflict of interest, I'm going to accuse myself from the discussion of this and, of course, the vote on it as well, and for item seven. Thank you. All right. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and fellow commissioners. Uh, Anthony Fusarelli with Community Planning, Housing and Development here this evening with Michelle Stafford and Rich Viola from Department of Environmental Services. Um, so the subjects for item four on the agenda include the following, the adoption of the Washington Boulevard and Kirkwood Road Special GLUP Study Plus and Concept Plan, adoption of associated amendments to the General Land Use Plan and Master Transportation Plan, and also a request to advertise, uh, authorize advertisement of future public hearings for the GLUP amendments associated with the three subject site uh, requests concurrent with future site plan and rezoning actions. So tonight's presentation will be an abbreviated version of the staff uh, RTA or request to advertise presentation that was provided to the commission uh, in October. We'll also include a few updates occurring since last month and as an overall structure, we'll follow the outline shown here. 
To establish the appropriate framing uh, for this presentation, our look at the study um, background and context begins really with the purpose of the study. And so the study began in 2016 when the county received three formal requests to change the general land use plan or the GLUP amendments for abutting sites just north of Virginia Square. As with all special GLUP studies, the primary purpose is to determine whether the requested GLUP change is within the realm of consideration. Second, in this case, given the, re the three requests for budding sites in, that the county had received at the same time, the county expanded the scope of this study plus to also include the crafting of uh, planning principles, conceptual guidance, and other recommendations that might help shape the future vision for this area. A recommendation as to whether a requested GLUP change or is or is not appropriate has to take into account a range of factors, including uh, fundamental county goals for growth and development, both as depicted in the GLUP booklet and also as summarized here. And in addition to consistency with these goals, the study also examines the relationship between the requ requested GLUP changes and other county policies, such as those relating to transportation. So located just outside of Virginia Square, the nearly 10-acre study area includes land parcels in the northwest quadrant of the Washington Boulevard and Kirkwood Road intersection. In terms of the actual GLUP change requests, the American Legion site is requesting a change from service commercial and semi-public to medium office apartment hotel. 11th Street Development Assemblage is requesting a change from service commercial to medium office apartment and hotel while a change from semi-public to medium residential has been requested for the YMCA site. And so as a GLUP study plus, staff actually expanded the study area in this case to include the balance of commercially zoned properties fronting Washington Boulevard to provide a more holistic approach to our analysis and planning. And so beginning in October of 2016, the main form for the special GLUP study plus process involved five meetings of the Long Range Planning Committee of the Planning Commission uh, with other pertinent stakeholder groups also represented at the table. Staff also held a community walking tour and two uh, community open houses throughout the process to solicit broader input into the study. Several elements of the study uh, have certainly received uh, relatively more attention than others. Um, as detailed in the October staff report for the request to advertise. Those subject areas primarily include circulation and access options, parking, open space, cultural resources, building heights, and development densities associated with various GLUP designations. And so in moving on to the GLUP and master transportation plan overviews, the current GLUP pattern uh, for the study area and surroundings is shown here where we also see the study area's location along the edge of the roslyn Boston corridor with high and medium density mixed use designations transitioning down to established low residential neighborhoods. In terms of the master transportation plan, Washington Boulevard and Kirkwood Road uh, fronting the study area are currently both designated as type D arterials um, and the balance of adjacent streets in the areas are neighborhood streets. Next, we will just present just a few highlights from the LRPC review, focusing primarily on a summary of the modeling analysis. And so in terms of the um, scenario modeling, staff first had to develop a framework uh, to really pull together circulation, open space, and building placement that would help inform the development of 3D form and massing models here. And we, after going through a number of iterations, which we saw back in October, we ultimately arrived at a relatively preferred scenario that then became the foundation for developing concept plan and GLUP and master transportation plan recommendations. So during those meetings, there was great attention paid to exploring alternative ways in which uh, the public realm and circulation um, could uh, lay out with just a few of those examples provided here. And while challenged by LRPC members and members, many members of the community, Staff is recommending that the area's street grid be enhanced by intro introducing through block connectivity for pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicles across the study area, while also reserving great flexibility in the future design and exact treatment of such connections. 
Staff's preference uh, or recommendations for adding this level of connectivity is certainly grounded in the county's master transportation plan policy guidance uh, for such conditions. Furthermore, enhancing the grid and expanding street connectivity here are also being recommended for the range of benefits associated with providing such facilities. More recently, the county has implemented such policies by achieving new streets or street connections with redevelopment across the county, in many instances as a result of, of prior county adopted plans, but there have also been instances where we've achieved uh, new connections in unplanned circumstances as well. Beyond the public realm, the other key focus of the LRPC discussions involved the review and discussion of building form and massing models. Depicted here, staff defined an initial set of scenarios based on different GLUP designations, approximately ranging with a build out between 200 and 1200 residential units across the study area, in addition to an envisioned new YMCA facility. By the end of the LRPC process, uh, staff generally arrived at the model shown here where, near, where new mixed use development is envisioned to define existing and new street alignments in the area where opportunities for open space and transitioning down of height and density can also be realized. And based on um, apparent LRPC support for this model, its general features and characteristics have then been used to inform the drafting of the plan's concepts and other recommendations. And so getting into uh, the adoption of the study plus and concept plan documents, we'll focus primarily here on guiding principles and concept plan elements. So uh, we are now up to 15 guiding principles. I believe we've added one since the last um, presentation in October. Um, the Guiding principles overall can really be best be thought of as overarching aspirational goals or big ideas that we'd like to achieve with redevelopment here. And so they've been framed and presented accordingly. Uh, one update I did want to point out, uh, last month this commission had um, some feedback and, and comments about um, Washington Boulevard and to the extent to which um, the plan did or didn't sort of speak to the future vision. And so we did have principle four established at that time um, in thinking through uh, further, we have um, modified some of the text, the caption text to really speak to the potential for on-street parking to perhaps be introduced as a, as a feature in the future streetscape designs in order to help provide that buffer between the pedestrians on the sidewalk and uh, passing traffic on uh, the street. Um, and points to this example shown here along Columbia Pike with Penrose Square as perhaps just one precedent. So that's an update we wanted to point out. Uh, the circulation of public space map really uh, seen here has been, is I think unchanged since um, last, uh, last meeting, uh, perhaps but for a modest um, wordsmithing of a, a label here or there. And so you'll recall that the recommended or addition of additional connectivity uh, is generally reflected in terms of location via the orange lines and arrows, accommodating vehicular access, pedestrian and bicycle access. Again, um, the idea that the, in the future with future development proposals, there would be um, the uh, broad uh, latitude in terms of defining the exact uh, detailing, the type, the topologies of the streets, the detailing of the streets. Um, and so on this next slide, um, this spread here is actually greatly revised from the version that we presented uh, a month ago, um, responding to comments uh, such as uh, precedent examples should uh, illustrate uh, streets that are perhaps narrower uh, than the 55-foot example that we had provided, um, as opposed to examples we had last month that maybe went up to 70 feet between building faces. Um, and so, in addition to that, there was, uh, we received input about, you know, perhaps there, there are shared street opportunities or pedestrian priority uh, zone opportunities. And so we've uh, included some additional precedent images in the bottom row to that effect. And so out of all these examples, the only one that was really uh, present in the uh, previous draft is the one, um, the Ninth Street example at the upper left. And so um, on October 21st, uh, we had presented the request to advertise to the board. They did uh, authorize advertisement of public hearings for November. Um, 
the, in their discussion, they had identified uh, primarily five com uh, key comments asking staff to come back uh, in November with additional information. And so uh, for tonight's purposes, focusing primarily on the third and fourth bullets here, uh, most directly related to transportation. And so one of the topics um, was a request basically for additional information on staff's uh, thoughts about anticipated changes in terms of origins and destinations with potential redevelopment, particularly of the YMCA site, and as it relates to um, the staff recommendation for additional connectivity uh, through block connectivity with the enhancing the street grid. And so what we see on the left in the yellow lines uh, and arrows are generally what the existing routes are today for um, someone uh, accessing the YMCA site. Uh, and compared with the image on the right, where we've generally overlaid uh, some of the, uh, the general locations of the additional street connectivity. And so I think a couple important points here is that under today's routing, everyone accessing the YMCA, particularly by automobile, needs to use 13th Street for at least some part of that trip. Um, with redevelopment and with the recommended concept, uh, one of the potential new access points for potential development on the Y site as well as the 11th Street development site could be off of Kirkwood. Um, that would provide the opportunity to provide another access point as an alternative to needing to access 13th Street to the Y. Um, and you see several other uh, recommended locations for connectivity that could also um, collectively provide different options, other options, and potentially result in an instance where less YMCA visitors are actually using 13th Street to get to that um, amenity. The other, um, one of the other transportation related questions focused on the intersection of Washington and Quincy. Um, and really the question in terms of whether or not the queue lengths for Quincy Street traffic heading southbound and turning to head eastbound on Washington are in some way leading to more trips on neighborhood streets such as 13th and 14th. And so um, as it happens, this is actually an, an active county project where the county is going to be rebuilding the signal um, at this intersection in the coming year. Um, DES will be reevaluating the left turn movements as construction progresses. And in any event, as currently designed, the signal rebuild will include infrastructure, the necessary infrastructure to add a left turn arrow if in fact future uh, study and monitoring of that intersection uh, warrants it. And then the, uh, finally, to conclude the presentation, um, just a few notes about the, the GLOP and MTP recommendations. So in terms of the general land use plan recommendations, um, action one and two to add note 27 to the GLOP map that makes reference to the adopted study document and uh, action two, to amend the Ball Family Cemetery from service commercial to semi-public. Uh, staff is recommending that those actions be approved in November. And the other three actions that speak to the potential consideration of either medium office apartment hotel or low, or low office apartment hotel designations be something that be taken into consideration with prospective future uh, site plan and rezoning applications. Relatedly, um, as we typically do with our special GLUP studies, the sort of uh, concluding milestone of that study is to request that the board authorize advertisement of future public hearings for those subject sites. And so item four of this report um, is in fact that. And that the, the point here is that these, if these get advertised, the public hearings for the final action on these changes would not occur until such point in the future where the site plans are actually acted on by the board as well. Uh, finally, the master transportation plan recommendations are to amend the map to add uh, area 13 as an area plan for new streets and to also redesignate or reclassify Washington Boulevard between Monroe Street or between Lincoln Street and Kirkwood Road to a type B arterial. Uh, with that, the staff recommendations are as um, noted in the staff report, and that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you very much. Um, just to kick things off here, I know 
Oh, sorry. Do we have any public speakers on this item, Mr. Best? Uh, we do. We have five speakers for this All item. All right. Thank you. Let's get started. The first speaker is Tad Lunger, followed by Nia Bagley. Um, good evening, uh, Chairman Slatt and members of the Transportation Commission. My name is Tad Lunger. I'm an attorney with McGuire Woods here on behalf of the Arlington YMCA, one of the applicants in this larger than normal special GLUP study. There are a few issues that we need that need to be addressed relating to the latest version of the study document released a day or so ago, but only one of them is transportation related, so I'll keep my comments to, to that particular issue. That issue relates to the circulation concept map in the study and the reference, references to it in the study document, which lays out some fairly broad connectivity and transportation modal goal, goals, which have been the subject of a lot of, a lot of discussion lately. First, just taking into account the topography, property boundaries, and likely de development sequencing, we know that the suggested locations are just not feasible in the real world. And we understand that these are not supposed to be hard and fast location recommendations, but rather the principles that are supposed to guide our design teams in the future, which we are totally on board with. The crux of the issue comes down not to whether or not there should be north, south, east, and west connectivity through the block, Instead, it is an issue of whether or not such connectivity should include automobile traffic. Currently, there is a recommendation that a high volume, large scale auto automobile connection north south through the block, joining Washington Boulevard and 13th Street, as well as a significant automobile oriented street east west through the center of the block furthers county policy. DES staff working on the study, who are not political, who have a totally objecta, objective and data-driven view of 13th Street as a transportation resource have an, an opinion we understand and respect. However, I believe the community, who I do not speak for, and the applicants in this situation are aligned on this point. A high volume vehicular connection and roads of the size proposed really don't reflect any of the stakeholders' thoughts of what is appropriate here. Pedestrian and bike connectivity through the block with limited vehicular access roads that do not encourage traffic through the block, but rather provide access into the block and planned open space concepts are universally desired by everyone involved except for professional staff. Doing otherwise seems inappropriate in this singular specific situation. Smaller auto access streets and safer and greener pedestrian and bike connectivity all seem to us, at least, to be more in line with the vision for this block by the applicants and the, and the neighbors. We maintain that there should be flexibility in this regard to allow for either auto and or bike and pedestrian connectivity through the site and that ne this needs to be identified specifically in any recommendation from the Transportation Commission to the County Board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Longer. Our next speaker is Nia Bagley, followed by Carmen Romero. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nia Bagley, and I am a neighbor. I live at the corner of North Monroe and Washington Boulevard. I'm also president of Boston Virginia Square Civic Association. Uh, I have given Mr. Uh, Best our written comments, so I'm going to go through those. Um, BVSEA has many concerns about the proposed addition of streets in the study area, particularly those which would connect Washington Boulevard to North 13th Street. We also oppose any changes to the small partial blocks of North 12th Road and North Kansas Street, which are part of this study. Throughout the LRPC process in which we participated, we have repeatedly expressed concern about adding to cut through traffic on North Monroe Street between North Quincy and Kirkwood Road. Cut through traffic concerns on North 13th Street are nothing new. You can find them cited 33 years ago in the 1984 Boston Virginia Square Conservation Plan. We believe new tolling, as we heard from Amanda tonight on I-66, which will start in just a little bit more than a month, will force even more traffic to Washington Boulevard and consequently to 13th Street. 
Moreover, 500 to 600 new seats will be added to Washington Lee High School at the Ed Center on North Quincy at the end of 13th and 14th Streets as early as 2020. And the future of the Buck property across the street from the Ed Center has not yet been decided, but will likely add even more traffic to Quincy that will be looking for a faster way to get around. 33 years later, with driving navigation applications like Waze sending more drivers to 13th Street, adding new streets that connect it from Washington Boulevard is simply not a good idea. In addition, our residents are concerned that adding new streets versus pedestrian and bike connections and alleys for access, which BVSCA has supported throughout the LRPC process, would take up more valuable land space, consequently adding to unprecedented and undesired building height and density in their well-established single-family neighborhood. We continue to support reasonable and responsible growth along Washington Boulevard, but request your very careful consideration for and support of our neighborhood, which at the end of the day will bear the brunt of any changes to the GLUP. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bagley. Our next speaker is Carmine, uh, Carmine Romero, followed by Matthew Allman. Good evening, uh, my name is Carmen Romero and on behalf of the Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing, I would like to voice support um, for the Washington Boulevard Kirkwood Road Special GLUP Study Plus. Staff has done a thorough job and has had a thoughtful process um, and even added an additional open house last night to get additional community feedback. Um, it's a challenging under undertaking, but on behalf of my nonprofit who's working with the American Legion, as well as in support of the YMCA, um, there is a lot of potential here to realize a lot of goals and visions that the county has for the county. Um, but for tonight, I want to limit my comments on the, the few limited areas of, of, of tweaks that I think the plan needs to, to really reflect the vision of all these community meetings we've participated in. And they do um, dovetail with the two speakers before me. Um, I think you know, it's really important to continue to press on these cross sections so that we're not making these huge roads throughout the site and instead really challenge ourselves to create more pedestrian bike friendly connections in a campus like setting to reflect what we have at, you know, George Mason across the way. We feel that's much more appropriate and consistent with the conversations we've had in the community. We were very pleased to see some of the additional images that staff added as part of this plan that was released um, a day or so ago with images that show right of ways that um, were reduced from something in the 68 foot range to more in the 40 foot range up in, in 50 foot range, which we really think are gonna allow us to design buildings with more green space and um, not have to cut back on affordable housing and legion programming. Um, but we would ask that you all set um, the expectation in the plan to show that there's gonna be phases of development. The YMCA, the Legion site, the Levenster are all gonna happen at different times. So really understanding interim cross sections and that no one site is gonna bear the brunt of the entire uh, cross sections as depicted in some of these. Um, and we've specifically asked on our northern edge that we share with the YMCA and the YMCA is in favor of this as well, you know, we will each build maybe 24 feet uh, or 25 feet of a 50 foot dimension, but you're gonna see it come online at different times. So how do we work together and put, you know, put that flexibility in the plan? Because otherwise, we won't be able to go forward in a phase one project. Um, and lastly, I really wanna you know, remind us what principle one is, evolving the area's automotive oriented development pattern into a pedestrian oriented mixed use place. That was really what we talked about in a lot of our meetings. And, and I think you've been you know, asked by the Civic Association, by Ted on behalf of the YMCA, and, and by myself um, on behalf of uh, APA and the Legion to really help us really challenge staff to seeing how we can implement that here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Romero. And our next speaker is Matthew Allman, followed by Albert Lewis. Hello, everyone. Uh, Matt Allman with Walsh Colucci, uh, speaking on behalf of 11th Street Development. Uh, 11th Street Development is one of the three applicants uh, who were the, actually the original uh, GLUP applicant who, who kind of got the study rolling here. Uh, they have assembled a, a group of parcels near the corner of Kirkwood Road and Washington Boulevard. Um, they have been to every meeting and, and tracked the development of this plan uh, through the extensive public process 
and uh, we want to commend staff for their, their thorough work on this. They've done a really commendable job balancing the various inputs and considerations uh, that have been raised throughout the LRPC discussion. And we know that's, that's never easy when you're dealing in one of these transitional areas to weigh those uh, considerations. Uh, in reviewing the final version of the plan that was released yesterday, uh, we too think that the addition of the precedent images and some of the language clarifying that alleys or pedestrian connections might be the appropriate outcome for some of these sites is a great improvement. Uh, and I would echo the comments of the previous speaker about the need to work together and, and find interim solutions where that's appropriate and make sure that each site as it's coming online is, is really making the right choice for the neighborhood in terms of that balance between the, the connection and the adjacent development and the landscaping. Uh, so again, we, we thank staff for all their hard work. We think this is a great outcome after a very thorough process and look forward to the adoption of the study. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allman. And our final speaker for this item is Albert Lewis. Good evening. My name is Albert Lewis. I live on 13th Street within a relatively short stone's throw of the Y development in this whole block. I also lived on Edgewood Street. My kids walked to Key uh, School. They were at Washington Lee High School, uh, HB, all around this area. Uh, as a resident of this block, I'm extremely concerned by this increased density that's going to be placed on our street. Uh, I've watched the cut through traffic grow uh, over the last 20 years. And at, at this point, we're, we're, we're extremely concerned that this, this type of development and the way in which the streets are designed are going to increase the volume to make it much more uncomfortable. Now, residential neighborhood depends on cars. We have to have cars to go to soccer practice, to even drive to the giant across the way sometimes. If you have a 97-year-old mother like mine, you need to have your car. You can't go walking or riding a bike. Uh, we're, we're very concerned that by eliminating and some of these principles where you're destroying the surface parking for underground parking, you're eliminating the use of our residential neighborhood. We're very concerned about the through traffic that they were talking about before. The, uh, the surface parking on Washington Boulevard. Washington Boulevard is a very major throughput street. And if we're going to slow down Washington Boulevard, we're going to have more traffic there. I, keep, I worry about it. I cross that to go walk to the metro. It takes a little bit, another five minutes because of the heavy volume on Washington Boulevard. That street. It seems to me that the, the throughput is something that should be maximized, and if we start having people cutting off and going into parking garages and so forth, it will be a, a, a much, it will put a burden on that street, uh, which will, will redound to the detriment of our community. In, the, in addition, eliminating all the surface parking will kill off the small businesses that are there, like the Rocklands, would not exist if you didn't have the surface parking. Uh, you look at the Malatang when you drive along, you'll see a little sign that says, go across to the American Legion parking lot so you can park because you're not going to go into the underground parking underneath Malatang. Uh, it's important for a, a, a residential community to have service commercial uh, available. Uh, the question is what traffic volume is appropriate for a residential neighborhood? Our street, many parts of it do not have sidewalks. Often it's one way. Start, cars will stop and to let one other car go through. That's not, that requires, uh, it's not a large street that is easy for cut through traffic. And for that reason, I ask that, you know, you look after this. I haven't, I just found out about this. You guys are protecting me. I'm a resident, I depend on you and I commend you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. And that concludes our speakers for this item. All right, do you commissioners have questions for staff? Commissioner Gerhardt. Actually, I've got a question for um, Ms. Bagley from uh, the Neighborhood Civic Association. Yeah, two, two questions. Uh, yes. Uh, the last speaker raised the question about uh, 
pedestrian traffic on 13th Street, and you raised that in yours, your uh, talk too. Uh, can, you confer, can you confirm whether this is a major pedestrian route uh, for Washington Lee High School? Well, including from areas to the e east uh, in uh, like Lion Village. I understand that students do use that as a cut through. They will walk on 13th Street to go from the high school over towards Kirkwood. That this would actually be the principal. This walking is this route. is the main way they go. From my understanding, I don't live on the street, but that's what the residents have told us. Yes. And perhaps the last gentleman could confirm whether that's that's the case. Okay. Second question is. Uh, you expressed a number of concerns in your letter, but I didn't, I don't recall seeing any specific recommendations the association had for, uh, directed towards us in terms of recommending that the board do something different from what's in the report. Is there, uh, are there any recommendations you have for us to consider um, uh, when we consider our Well, all along, resolution? all along we have, uh, opted instead to support uh, pedestrian alley, smaller streets that wouldn't necessarily support big time traffic uh, as ways to get in and around. Obviously, you're gonna have to have emergency vehicle access and things like that, but um, not only to spare 13th Street from additional traffic, but the bigger concern too for residents was if we use land for larger streets, then the heights and densities are gonna go up, which they have have not been used to at all in their neighborhood. So um, we support anything that isn't going to take people from Washington Boulevard up to 13th Street because you're going to have to have, you know, entrances and things in there. We just don't want that connection, which has been suggested in the past. So are there specifics then in the plan that you would suggest that we advise the board not to support or, or to, to take out of the plan or? I'm just trying to understand where the neighborhood's coming from. I know this has been a long process, and I haven't really been that, that involved in it. Other right. At an initial meeting at Lion Village, uh, right. which I'm on the, the executive committee there, right. um, maybe two years ago. Right. All, all along, the Civic Association has held that we don't want any um, uh, entry to 13th Street from Washington Boulevard. So we would be open to the flexibility of looking at other things, but to dump more traffic from Washington Boulevard to 13th. And currently there are none at, at this point in time between Monroe and Kirkwood. Well, there are none of where they're talking about putting. I mean, people are bailing to there now. It's already an issue. It was an issue 33 years ago. So um, we don't want to make it more of an issue with how this study goes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner O'Bear. Mr. Fusarelli, uh, I believe we heard at Planning Commission that the primary concern about traffic uh, was traffic coming down from Kirkwood and then using 13th Street to get to Washington Boulevard uh, rather than going from Washington Boulevard through 13th Street uh, up to 66. Is that... Um, in the comments that have been collected along this process, uh, uh, was there a clear trend, and, and is that, and if so, is that the trend that was presented at Planning Commission? I think, and um, Michelle and Rich can add to this, but I think as far as the comments and input that and concerns that I had heard raised personally throughout the process were perhaps a little bit more global in the sense that you know that there could be opportunities. I think there's this perception that there could be opportunities for additional traffic through this area in all directions, both from Kirkwood using 13th to head west towards Quincy, from Washington to go through the study area and head north towards 13th and then on to other destinations. And then also, I think I had always understood some of the concern to be associated with what trips might be generated from future development within the study area. So. Um, if I may just ask a follow-up question. Uh, the presentation that you gave us looked at the efforts that the county staff has in mind to deal with the effect of queues on uh, Quincy and Washington. Did, did you do anything to look at how the, since, since the, the last round of, uh, 
meetings before the RTA, have you done anything to look at the effect uh, at mitigating cut through traffic uh, or preventing cut through traffic using 13th to get from 66 via Kirkwood? I don't know that we've done anything specific, but I, I might look to Rich or Michelle to add to that. I mean, I, I, I think what we, we've tried to, to address is, you know, what is the um, what are the options right there as far as people can get around? Um, I think this this graphic here gives a, a sense that you can actually reduce some of the traffic in the neighborhood residential streets through some additional connections. Certainly, um, there's traffic on Lincoln Street that's, be, that's being used to go through the neighborhood and uh, to provide an alternative to that could actually reduce some of the traffic that those residents face today, so. Is that sufficient for your question, Mr. Ware? Other commissioner questions, comments? Commissioner Perkins. As someone who lives with an active um, cut through traffic uh, problem in my neighborhood, I am sympathetic to some of the neighbors' uh, concerns about the potential increase in um, cut through traffic through this site. But I think that um, if we allowed for every potential site um, to basically say no to um, adding connectivity through the site, then we end up with a development pattern that looks a lot like places where every possible trip is funneled onto the major roads and then the major roads become congested and unusable. So I think that we should be addressing um, the impact of cut through traffic and its undesirable traits through road design and rather, rather than um, through cutting off the um, the grid altogether. So I would like to see these internal um, connections designed more like, um, there's a typology that we have just approved in the master transportation plan called the shared street. And I think that if we apply that road design to the network internally, it will encourage um, people to drive carefully and um, possibly avoid the street because it won't exactly be a very quick way of getting through. It'll be um, more leisurely. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanna agree with Commissioner Perkins here. Um, I think the connectivity here is important and it's easy to, f to miss why. Um, if there isn't connectivity internal that cars can drive on, that means all of the parking garage and exits and entrances need to be onto the, the outer streets. Um, which ultimately ends up sending traffic in all sorts of crazy ways just to get out onto the street that it wants to be on. For instance, you can imagine somebody at the, uh, some future building on the American Legion site that wants to get to Kirkwood. If there isn't internal circulation within this large area that we're talking about, then that car has got to make a left out of its parking garage exit onto Washington Boulevard and then another left onto Kirkwood. Um, and then you multiply that times every building that we're building on this site. Um, you end up adding lots of extra driving that's not necessary just because they can't traverse the site. Just the traffic that is being generated by these buildings, the traffic that is coming to these buildings, um, having to go around and around in various ways just to get headed in the direction that they're trying to head. Um, so I support um, uh, what Commissioner Perkins is saying, which is build the connectivity, um, but build it in a way that discourages uh, through traffic. Uh, and I think our shared street typology um, which builds uh, a street, you know, around the idea that people can be walking there and cars can be exiting a parking garage and driving briefly for a block through there in order to get onto a main street um, as, as the answer to this problem. Other commissioner thoughts or questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna second you guys, um, both of you, um, because I think given the way that um, our transportation um, approaches are changing with ways and a whole bunch of other um, you know car sharing services and using and using our neighborhoods differently um, we have to think about how that is happening but we can't stop it I don't think at this point I think it's part of our um, what's happening and so I, I just second the connectivity piece and and the ways that we can slow down traffic in neighborhoods um, but 
giving people an ability to get through neighborhoods um, because that's where they live and they, and they have cars and they want to go the, um, get to places um, just as easily as the people who are looking to get around through the neighborhoods and off the main, main roads. So I think um, thinking smartly about that is what we should be doing. Anybody else? Commissioner Weir. Uh, has staff considered or recommended or even suggested without a recommendation any language that might deal with some of the concerns that have been uh, articulated here and I think also brought up generally since the last RTA having to do with uh, phasing issues, uh, topography issues, and the idea that uh, that it might be a number of, of, of um, site plans before uh, uh, pedestrian priority or, or shared streets are actually what the grid in that area looks like just as a function of needing paved streets to get construction equipment into the area? So, so I think on the, like the whole phasing, the contemplation about the phasing elements and aspects of this, I don't think the document, I mean, we've certainly had some thought in terms of how operationally and how sort of over time that phasing could occur. Uh, we certainly have other instances, streets that have been added with new development in elsewhere in the county where a development site's provided half a street and then the adjacent development site has provided the other half of the street a number of years after. And so I think, you know, in concept, you know, that broad idea is something that probably could have good applicability here, especially given the adjacency of these sites and the fact that, you know, the likelihood that redevelopment is going to probably happen at different times across the different sites. So um, I, I think that just maybe to clarify my question, which was definitely not clear, um, uh, I think that what we heard from some of the public speakers was that there are going to be site plans that are proposing streets that are ultimately temporary because the reality of the matter is that Caddy Corner to this site plan is going to be another uh, proposal coming down the line that is going to require uh, those streets to be built such that they facilitate heavy construction equipment. Um, and and when you've got temporary streets that you know construction equipment is going to be moving on top of uh, uh, for some years, then you're not going to be building a nice pedestrian priority uh, shared street. And I think that that what we sort of got forecast to us from public comment was that that the neighborhood might see the site, the first site plans to come in uh, and rightfully be very concerned when they see streets that are not, th that are streets that are gonna be for neighbors to build stuff on and not necessarily the concept streets that are included in, in this document that you just added. And so I guess that's kind of the concern that I had in mind um, uh, in, in thinking about possible language that we might recommend to the board. I could see how we can encounter some of those issues as we go through kind of development piecemeal. I think having this plan is certainly gives us a lot of guidance to sort of identify for those projects as they come in what what the expectation would be. Um, I believe we could probably add some language that would help with that sort of situation where we have um, an incomplete attempt to kind of build in that, that grid where it has to come part by part and how maybe they can be phased in and uh, considered as part of those site plan conditions where maybe something comes in uh, initially as a, a one sort of form of, of the street with some additional modifications that come in maybe with, as the, the latter part of the development is built. So. Commissioner Gerhardt. Staff, given the neighborhood concerns about the impact on traffic and internal to the neighborhood, has staff given any concern, any consideration to including as part of the plan some obligation for uh, developers as they develop to contribute towards funding towards uh, neighborhood traffic calming? Uh, this might be part of the, the expectation and community benefits with perhaps specific goals set out to address some of these issues 
and pay for them to ensure that they get done. And I would note as a precedent, when Market Common went in up, Commons went in up in Clarendon, uh, Lion Village very quickly realized the, the great potential for the cut through of traffic uh, through the middle of the neighborhood to get to, to uh, Lee Highway. Uh, Lion Village is wide open. There's been a lot of resistance in the neighborhood to closing off individual streets because you know, it's just a, a bigger than a neighbor type thing and you shift the traffic to the next neighborhood street. Uh, and there were, I, I forget how much in the way of funding uh, McCaffrey, who's the developer, provided, whether it was in the neighborhood of a half million dollars or maybe even a million dollars or more, I don't remember. Uh, but those funds were contributed uh, during the build out and uh, a fair amount of the traffic calming that you see on the neighborhood side was funded by the developer as the development progressed. For example, uh, the narrowing of uh, Edgewood Street and, and making it one way going into the neighborhood so that all that traffic didn't pour through the neighborhood down Edgewood, down to Highland, down to Lee Highway. I mean, there's still a lot of traffic that comes through there, but it sort of helped kind of diffuse it and make it go in different places and uh, reduce the attractiveness of that. And uh, perhaps you do something like that here as this development occurs, it may, this development may have a lesser impact than a major shopping center like Market Common, uh, but on the other hand, it may provide some ability for the neighborhood to get some relief and get it quickly without having to go through a county funding process where there are maybe funds this year but not next year and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I would say as, as Market Common is one example of several that I can think of that did give contributions towards uh, traffic calming and that was, that was developed as part of the um, the contributions that were identified at the time the site plan was being um, uh, discussed. And so that would probably be the same case when we have any sort of development coming in for discussion and for review here uh, in this general area too. So that opportunity might be that we identify some needs that um, a developer could be contributing to to kind of um, address some concerns of the neighbors. But, but it might, might be helpful that this plan as it moves forward in terms of concept identify that as something that would be expected of developers uh, to help address neighborhood concerns and, and that sort of thing, as opposed to necessar necessarily designating specific amounts here. I, I, it's right. probably a little early for that, but, uh, um, but still, to, to recognize this and, and again, I'm trying to see if we can address some of the neighborhood concerns and some of the larger concerns <laughs> given the pedestrian traffic. Um, between neighborhoods and the school. Mr. Chairman. So I'm sorry, we, we were just, <laughs> I apologize, but we were just discussing it and so we think that might be an, op an opportunity. We'd like to kind of tie it to those developers and, and, and the TIA that they would probably do as part of their project and, and sort of that might identify some of those. But uh, you would, re but the, the, the idea of doing this might be identified in the plan? Yes, that's what okay. I was, that's so, what I was so trying right. to tell you. Yes, sorry. Great, other commission comments or Commissioner Perkins? I'm looking at the draft um, concept plan, this item here. On page 18, there are a couple of graphics at the bottom. One is a proposed 28-foot right-of-way that has two 11 and a half foot drive lanes and a five foot sidewalk. And I was just going to ask, um, 11 and a half foot for a drive lane for what is supposed to be a uh, low traffic, um, sort of calmed street, that's wider than the drive lanes that we have on a lot of neighborhood arterials and other uh, more aggressive typologies. Do you have any comment? Yeah, I think it's partly the way this is dimensioned. Uh, it's probably a 10 foot lane with a foot and a half for a gutter pan. So that makes it the 11 and a half, but it's really probably uh, asphalt of 10 feet width in each direction. Um, there's some 
concern if we go a little less than that, if we go to some, something even narrower than that. Uh, an emergency vehicle, a fire truck, would probably have a hard time dealing with a roadway that has less than 23 feet between the curbs. Um, that's general direction that we hear from our fire marshal is they really need about that much room. So I would think this is kind of uh, okay. appropriate. Yeah. Okay, and the other comment that I have is on the 48-foot wide of right of way, there appears to be a typo in that it calls for a 17-foot parking lane. <laughs> that, is that is certainly a typo. Thank, Thank you. you for pointing that out. Seven foot would be the appropriate. <laughs> that makes more sense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further discussion on this? All right, then I will move that we recommend the county board adopt the attached resolution to adopt the Washington Boulevard and Kirkwood Road Special General Land Use Plan Study Plus and Concept Plan as shown in attachment A with the additional recommendation that they clarify that the street connections called for in the circulation map be typed as shared streets as per the Master Transportation Plan and that we recommend they adopt the attached resolution to amend the general land use map as shown in attachment B, adopt the attached resolution to amend the master transportation plan as shown in attachment C, and to adopt the attached resolution to authorize advertisements for notice of public hearings by the Planning Commission County Board to consider all general land use plan amendments for three general areas located on the block northwest of the Washington Boulevard and Kirkwood Road intersections as shown in attachment D, concurrent with the consideration of rezoning and final site plan applications associated with each site as outlined in our draft board report dated October 26th, 2017. We have a motion and it has been seconded. I will point out it is the county manager's recommended motion with the additional proviso of noting that the internal street circulation uh, shown on the circulation map be typed as a shared street as per the MTP. Is there discussion, Commissioner? Yep. Just, a, just a quick question. Uh, does, in terms of the discussion we had earlier about uh, possible funding for the neighborhood improvements, you know, to, to assist with traffic calming and uh, other situations, uh, is that concept part of what we have here or do we need to add something to our motion to make that clearer? So I think from the staff perspective, we heard that input. Their head yes, earlier, but we, we'll, we'll go back and consider it, but it's certainly within the commission's discretion to, or sort of pleasure to kind of incorporate that as part of its formal letter to the board for posterity. Mr. Chairman, can we do that? I could certainly entertain that amendment to the motion. So made, or do I need to spell something out? Spell something out. Other discussion about the motion while you wordsmith something, if you would like. <laughs> Is there any further discussion of the motion? Mm. Okay. Oh. Commissioner Weir maybe has something to say. I'm gonna offer this as discussion uh, before making a motion to get the sense of fellow commissioners, both as to whether it's clear and to whether it's necessary. Um, but I am inclined to move, again, not moving, inclined to move uh, that um, an additional amendment recommending that the board direct uh, that the adopted plan include language clarifying that uh, to the extent site plans are approved consistent with these amendments uh, to the Glupin MTP, uh, or to the extent that, that plans submitted can, uh, under these amendments anticipate any temporary streets uh, or phased streets as part of the construction process, that those plans also indicate the final design of those streets and how they'll become shared streets. Um, and I offer that uh, to my fellow commissioners, again, both for whether it's clear and for whether it's necessary. Commissioner Bros, did you want to weigh in on that? <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not um, very familiar about how the process goes in terms of when you're building and you create temporary streets, but I would have imagined there's a, there's a, um, 
an accepted method, methodology of doing that. But I, I hear your concern that it, 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 it sends a message to the neighborhood. Is that what you're talking about? Um, and wanting to clarify that what they see is not exactly what they'll yes, get, right? Yes, I want the neighborhoods yeah. and site plans to see uh, what they're ultimately gonna get. And I want anyone developing under it um, to, to be on notice that they have to, uh, that, that everything that they propose mm -hmm. has to include what it's gonna look like and how it's gonna get there. Right. Uh, I'll weigh in on that. I think just given the amount of development that we've seen come through that has done interim alignments or built part of a street or that sort of thing, um, it's always been made clear during site plan review um, what the ultimate goal that we were expecting to get to was going to be. Um, and we've seen that, for instance, on, you know, uh, you know we're, we saw that as 12th Street was built in Pentagon City. Um, where we, you know, we still have half of a street uh, behind the Rite Aid on Columbia Pike, um, but it was certainly clear even in that form-based code uh, development what, you know, what street we were going to end up with at the end of it. Um, so, uh, especially given, you know, this isn't even a sector plan; it's just a special GLUP study. All of any development that happens here will have a site plan review. Um, I think uh, it's not necessary to go to that extent you know, within the GLUP study design. I think that that's probably correct. Uh, Commissioner Gearhart, do you have an, an amendment? Uh, yeah, let, let me just read this and see if, and again, if staff's got some better wording, that I'd certainly appreciate it. That the, uh, the plan, assuming that's the, the proper word for this, uh, also provide that as part of the community benefits, that developers be expected to provide funding for neighborhood traffic calming through the site plan process. One more time that the plan also provide that as a part of community benefits that developers be expected to provide funding for neighborhood traffic calming through the site plan process. And I would assume as part of that, we're also talking about uh, uh, pedestrian safety enhancements and that sort of thing, including for um, students that are walking to Washington Lee High, high School. Gotcha. Vacation, please. Are we trying to, pre it seems, sounds like we're trying to predetermine what's going to happen during the site plan review process by just outlining it here. I mean, we're, we're outlining well, a I mean, broad uh, set of principles that I don't understand where you're taking it to. I don't, I don't understand this, where to you're going the, to. I also don't understand where this would be put in in the GLUP study plan, which is kind of like a sector plan, we would have a rider on there that says, hey, when you propose a site plan under this um, GLUP study, that it would be, I guess, considered favorably if you were also to propose funding some neighborhood traffic calming. Is that how this would be interpreted? That would be my expectation. I'm trying to give the, the neighborhood some kind of handle so that when projects start coming in and neighborhood neighbors say, hey, this is gonna have a big impact on my street and uh, that as part of the process, uh, that this has been identified as part of the, the, the plan and that the neighbor, neighborhood then has some kind of leverage through the site plan process to get some kind of funding to address the situation and not just be out there uh, competing with the, let's say the, the arts group and others uh, uh, because this is going to have an impact on the neighborhood. And, and again, if staff has got, uh, see Mr. Leach up here, if they've got some better, before, better idea of how to, how to before get we there, further, I'm, I'm certainly willing to consider it. I'm, I'm just concerned that the neighborhood not find itself left out uh, 10 years from now with a lot of extra traffic and nowhere, no way to get funding from the county to alleviate the problems or reduce them anyway. Uh, before we further discuss the motion, is there a second? Before I second it, uh, I would actually like to hear from staff about. We can't actually do anything. With I mean, you can second it for just for the purposes of discussion. Well, I'll second it to get it to the table. Then. There we go. All right. Does staff have, would like staff like to weigh in on how this might work or whether staff's opinion? this even has a place in the GLUP study? Uh, 
I would strongly recommend to the Commission that this does not have a place in the GLUP study. This is a higher level document. And this Commission has reviewed many, many site plans. And our goal as a community and as a staff is to make sure that each site plan works in its environment. And it starts with what is the proposal following um, the GLUP and MTP recommendations. We're charged with evaluating that project and making sure that it works and doesn't have adverse impacts. And that could take many different forms. It could be um, a robust TDM program. It could be enhanced crosswalks. It could be upgraded bus uh, facilities. Um, so I think um, uh, we would strongly recommend not uh, dictating the specific outcome of what is a, a negotiated process. And it really also starts with what is the proposal? Um, there is existing traffic on this block today generated by a commer strip commercial and a, and a YMCA. That's the baseline. And we have to evaluate these proposals in terms of both the land use, the expected trip generation, what the infrastructure proposal is in, in, in a wholesome way. Um, so I, that's my advice to the commission. Thank you, Mr. Leach. Um, I would agree. Um, that was kind of the direction I was tending. Um, and to Mr. Commissioner Gearhart, I would say principle 13 in the design uh, in the... Is that in here? Are we calling this document? <laughs> Concept study plus, or? It's the study. Oh, concept plan. Principle 13 in the concept plan um, is where I think the neighborhood can very easily hang their hat during a site plan review and say, you know, principle 13 says we're going to take effective measures to manage additional transportation demands generated by future redevelopment that does not excessively burden local residential streets and say, as part of making sure this doesn't burden my local residential street, there needs to be traffic calming put in. Um, I think there is already sufficient place to make that sort of argument very strongly in site plan review. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Perkins. Um, if the potential site applicants were asked to make a contribution to neighborhood traffic calming um, and those funds were used for neighborhood traffic calming installation, either construction or reconfiguring of a street that is not immediately adjacent to the property, do we run into some issues where there lacks a nexus between us asking them for that money and where that money is actually being spent? Yeah, my understanding is that all contributions, uh, community benefit as part of site plans have to have some logical nexus to the development impacts. Um, Typically during a site plan, the local streets that are adjacent to that property are reconstructed in some sort of configuration that most of the time represents some amount of traffic calming. And so asking the applicant for additional funds to go traffic calm somewhere else, uh, I think we can, I'm not an attorney, but I think that from my understanding runs into some, some issues. I'm also not an attorney, but I will say offsite transportation community benefits are not unheard of. I, th I think what we're talking about here are additional traffic that it has an impact where there is a nexus. It may not be immediately across the street, but it may be a block away. And it's and I and I think there's probably a lot of precedent in the county for this. Sensing uh, not a lot of support for this, I'll withdraw the motion. All right, the motion is with. Wait, that's yeah. the chairman. Once it's been seconded, it's with the commission. Can, <laughs> just just a, just a few words uh, to, to the members of the community that came here tonight. Thank you for for being here. We appreciate hearing from you. Um, please understand that this document they're talking about is a very high level principle document. Um, we take very seriously uh, issues with cut through traffic and, and additional cars. We do everything we can to make sure things like that do not happen. Um, once a site plan comes out that is more specific to this site, we would hope that you come back and tell us about what happens so we can hear from you. And your, your input is the most important next, well, next to staff, the most important. We'd like to hear from you. Um, we need to hear from you. It's that important. Um, at this point, you know, cut through traffic. I have kids. I'm very sensitive um, to slowing down traffic. When I cut through a neighborhood, slow down like it's your kids living there. 
So please understand that. And um, again, please come back when we have a My more recommendation plan. is to, um, when the site plans come up for review, participate in the site plan review process because that's where the real comments can be incorporated early in the process. Any discussion of the seconded motion that is before us? All, right. All those in favor of the motion to amend? That's one. All those opposed? That's six opposed. So that fails, uh, leaving the original motion on the table, uh, which is the county manager's recommendation with the additional proviso about shared streets in the concept uh, circulation map. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Best, the commission will take a five minute break while we get ready for the next item. All right, Mr. Best, on to the next item, please. The next item is item number five. This is the 13th Street South MTP amendments. Uh, Rich Viola from uh, DES Transportation is here to give you a staff overview, and we have one speaker on this item. Uh, good evening. Um, this is an item that actually came to the commission last month, but it was as a request to advertise. So now what we are moving ahead to moving to the public hearings with the Planning Commission and with the County Board, which will be taking place over the next month. So I will give you a very brief uh, presentation. Please ask questions uh, on any items if I go over too quickly. 
Um, so the request is to amend the master transportation plan, uh, redesignate a portion of 13th Street South, um, which is shown on the map of the MTP uh, uh, as an alley, and I'll talk about that. That alley would not be actually depicted on the map because our, our MTP map does not show alleys. Uh, uh, this is the um, illustration of, of the area. Uh, it's a connection of 13th Street South um, between Monroe and South Glebe Road. Uh, some illustrations of the existing conditions. This is the, um, the, the, the connection that's there now that is designated as a, as a street on the MTP map currently. As you can see, it's very narrow. It has a driveway style entrance. It has a um, paver path adjacent to a, it's about a 10 foot wide asphalt uh, roadway. Um, and has, as you can see, is really uh, restricted for access. And there's a do not enter sign that actually does not prevent you to get, does prevent you from getting access in from Monroe Street. Uh, another view of that same roadway from a different direction. Uh, as you can see, um, it, this was never constructed to be a street. Uh, it was indicated on our map, probably mistakenly, but at the time we had discussions about perhaps it should have been a street. So let me just go through the history. Um, it's, this is from the Majestic Oak site plan, uh, mostly townhouse development that took place in 2003. Uh, it created a number of new internal streets for, as part of that development uh, between Glebe Road and, Mon and Monroe Street, 13th Street being one of those streets. And um, there were a number of references as to a, this connection that went the last about 150 feet and, and linked up to Monroe Street. Sometimes it referred to as a driveway, sometimes an alley. Um, at the time, the community adjacent, just the immediate west of this area, um, was concerned about cut through and, and, and issues about uh, access. And so, it, it, as it was determined that this segment would, would not be built as a full street at that point. Uh, and as you can tell, it does not possess the characters of, of what we would normally consider a street. Um, our map does show it, and I think it's largely because when we built our MTP map uh, in 2007, when we first adopted it, we, what we used as our base was the, um, the GLUP plan. And for some reason, this was shown on the GLUP plan. I think that's something we can modify as well. Um, in any case, there have been some issues with the neighbors about this uh, street. Uh, it has been largely been closed, chained with... Uh, uh, bollards and things uh, by the by the homeowners association um, there have been some issues about zoning violations uh, requirements to open it up and so now they have come back to the to the county board for a with a minor site plan amendment application to modify their uh, site plan and there are some additional um, conditions that are being added to the to this development and are some that are being language which is being modified to address access and easements. Uh, so the public process has been, there have been um, all the members of the Majestic Oak Homeowners Association have been polled and they are in support of this change. Uh, so does the adjacent neighborhood, the Douglas Park Civic Association. We did have uh, this item presented to the commission last month for the request to advertise and you did consent to that. And the um, minor site plan amendment is to be heard by the county board in the November meeting and is actually put on the consent agenda uh, because there seems to be um, unanimous support for it at this time. Um, so I'll just read the proposed resolution that the master transportation plan map shall be amended to change the designation of a section of 13th Street South between South Kenmore Circle, which is one of the internal streets within that um, majestic oak uh, site plan, and South Monroe Street from neighborhood Minor Street to Alley, and that it and to remove it from the Arlington County MTP map. Um, and so the designate the uh, recommendation is simply to to uh, adopt that resolution. Thank uh, you, Mr. Viola. Sure. Uh, when we saw this for an RTA, uh, we didn't have the the actual site plan board report. Oh, sorry. Are there any public speakers on this item? <laughs> oh, we do. We have one speaker, Matthew Allman. One of these days, I'll get better at remembering to do that without being reminded. Especially so. Hello again. I promise this is the last time you're going to hear from me tonight. I promise. Uh, <laughs> until next month, right? Uh, 
Again, Matt Allman with Walsh Colucci, uh, speaking on behalf of the Homeowners Association, Majestic Oak, um, here to speak in favor of the MTP amendment. Uh, staff mentioned the uh, HOA has filed a minor site plan amendment uh, to really bring clarity uh, to what is now a 15-year-old site plan that has had some latent ambiguities in the site plan conditions, and it's just time to clean, clean those up and move on. Um, the, the application, which of course is not before you tonight, but is very much related to the MTP amendment, uh, does three things. It eliminates those ambiguities in the site plan condition requirements, so there's no more confusion about what the alley is supposed to be or what the streets are supposed to be. Uh, we'll be amending the existing easements over the alley and internal streets. They're already in place, but we'll be um, amending that language so that the county gets the level of access that it desires. Uh, and then we are requesting permission to work with the fire department for a barrier over the 12 foot uh, driveway that would facilitate emergency access but would discourage the cut through traffic and full public uh, vehicular movement through that area. Um, as staff mentioned, this is unanimously supported by every member of the neighborhood. It's probably my first and probably will be my only zoning case where anything is supported by every member of the neighborhood. Uh, and the reason for that is if you, if you get out on the site and you look at it and you walk around a little bit, you immediately feel the tightness of that 12-foot alley dimension uh, and, and get a sense for the difficulty of navigating that slope and those movements. Uh, it's just not a public street. It wasn't built that way. It, it can't be that way. So um, we urge you to uh, uh, support this MTP amendment. And if there are any questions about the particulars, particulars of the application, I'd be happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allman. Um, so when we saw this for RTA, um, we just had a staff report. We didn't have a copy of the, the previous uh, site plan approval. Um, and so the only thing that jumps out at me here now that we have that is in the list of relevant conditions in the board report. It doesn't mention condition 50 which says, uh, it's on page 37, uh, for those who want to look at it themselves, the developer agrees that within 30 days after request by the county manager, it shall take all reasonable and prudent action, including installing signage or traffic signals, to convert the section of 13th Street South from the western lot line for Townhouse 22 to Monroe Street to a one-way street, which to me seems like it is directly talking about the driveway access that we're discussing, um, and not only refers to it as a street, but refers to it as a piece of 13th Street South, um, which to me seems like it ought to be called out as one of the relevant conditions when we're having this discussion. Um, having gone out and seen the actual conditions on the ground, um, I agree that right now it is functioning like an alley um, and that we shouldn't be trying to get public automotive traffic through there. Um, but I certainly think in the future, pending some redevelopment someday, um, that it would be a useful road connection or street connection um, if it were built out to be an actual street. Um, so I... Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Perkins. Does this mean that the developer did not actually um, fulfill its obligation under site plan number, uh, condition number 50? I mean, one would presume they only would have had to if the county manager had actually <laughs> made the request that they convert it. Because it appears street. that most of the justification for this is that it doesn't look like a street right now and that it is a incredibly narrow and doesn't meet all the conditions. It doesn't meet all the characteristics of a street, but that's kind of like saying you didn't build it as a street. It's not a street. Therefore, we shouldn't call it a street. And it's... No, I think the I think the other conditions that staff have outlined make it pretty clear that they weren't expected to build it out any more than it already is. It says, take, including signage, take all reasonable and prudent action to convert to a one-way street. I guess that's saying you should just install signage or signals to say, hey, make this only one way. Right, don't go in this direction. Okay. Uh, does staff have any reaction to uh, or interpretation on condition 50? 
Um, I, I have to admit that I'm not as familiar with what was required of the developer at the time the site plan was approved and whether any um, this proposal was, was enforced in some manner or not, so I cannot really t um, comment on it. Mr. Allman, do you have anything to add about Condition 50? Thank you. Thank you, that's a great question, and I think you've identified precisely why we are where we are so many years after the fact. Um, I'm looking at condition. Mr. Allman, I think we're referring to the 2003. This is the 2003, yes. So this is the original 2003 approval. Uh, condition 15A lays out the what was expected in terms of the roadway sections. 15A references a, a driveway entrance to the site's 12-foot driveway, private driveway between 23 and 24. So I, I think the confusion is what is the interplay between 15A and 50? And, and that's what we're trying to resolve. That's the perhaps patent ambiguity that you were referring to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, the staff, so what I don't, f I will admit I don't fully understand is how this MTP amendment interplays with when this minor site plan amendment is considered. Because I would say long term that we would like this section to actually be a street sometime in the distant future. But I would say, given the current conditions on the ground and the current short-term expectations, that we should expect it to function like an alley. So with, with that desire in mind, what is the correct sequence of events? Does it, the MTP get updated to call it an alley for now and we change the MTP again in the future? Or does the MTP continue to call it a street and we just accept that given the current development and the current site plan, that we are temporarily deviating from the MTP due to other constraints, due to other conditions. I mean, I, I think what we're recognizing is that we don't have it, an opportunity to really complete a street in, through that section there, unless there's some sort of si significant redevelopment of at least one of those two properties, uh, 23 or 24, lots 23 or 24. So at this point, I think we're recognizing what's reality and um, a plan might be to kind of consider whether there's something could be done in the future, but really for now we are trying to adjust to what we have. Commissioner Gerhardt. I seem to have a vague recollection of this going through the site plan process back in 2003. And I seem to recollect that neighbors across the street were very concerned about a connection and traffic coming, coming through and so forth. Um, what was the staff policy on designating things as alleys back in 2003? Were we doing that? And, and was a policy against creating new alleys, so we called it a street but really wanted it to function as an alley? And so that this would be consistent with the original intent or has, has something changed since that time? I'm not sure I can recall what the what the county's policy was in, on that in 2003, but um, I, I believe we were interested in seeing an actual street connection, and we worked through that matter with the community and as part of the site plan. And what we wound up with, what, what is, is what is rec reflected in the conditions in this uh, board report from 2003. I'm comfortable with, you know, staff's recommendation at this point. Do, does this designation further? mean that the um, local HOA can put a chain across it or put up a bollard like they had attempted? Can you address that again, Mr. Viola? Y yes, um, through the uh, proposed uh, revisions to the site plan conditions, I think that is one of the measures that is uh, uh, permitted as far as some of the re revised language is that the 
pedestrian bicycle way would always be open for access and that the um, 12 foot wide alley could be closed, but uh, what would allow some sort of uh, entrance by emergency vehicles. How does an emergency vehicle quickly get through a bollard or a chained entrance? Uh, there are some uh, mechanisms that they can use that sort of could electronically open the, the gate, drop the, or drop the, um, the barrier that is used. Is, is the HOA actually going to go through the expense of installing one of those? I think we're getting a little far afield at yeah. this point. Uh, uh, Very well. That is the intent that they would provide a device that would allow the uh, fire department to get in and out uh, in time of emergency quickly. Okay. All right. I move that we recommend the county board adopt the attached resolution to amend the MTP map to change the designation of a section of 13th Street South between Kenmore Circle and South Monroe Street from a neighborhood minor street to an alley and to remove it from the county MTP map. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> Opposed? Commissioner Perkins. All right. Thank you. The next item is item six. This is the off-street residential parking for multifamily residential projects. This is an action item. Uh, Stephen Krem is here from DES Transportation. And we do have like, four speakers. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I am here with you this evening to talk about the guidelines that came out of the Residential Parking Working Group process. I'm joined this evening by uh, Dennis Leach, our Director of Transportation. Also on the other side of the room, uh, Susan Bell, who has been a consultant on this project. And of course, James Schroll, who in addition to Mr. Perkins was part of the working group. Uh, <laughs> wave of the hand. And uh, Mr. Schroll, of course, uh, chaired that uh, during the period that they were meeting. Um, as a reminder, this is guidance related to off-street parking requirements for you, the Planning Commission staff, and the board as they approve site plan, uh, multifamily developments, as well as uh, unified commercial mixed use uh, development use permits in the two metro corridors. So this is what we hope to uh, accomplish with you this evening. Uh, we hope to receive the same kind of um, uh, fulsome support for the policy as we did in the request to authorize advertisement. Um, as a very brief reminder of what got us to this point, there was a recommendation or a directive from the county board to the county manager in December of 2013 to examine the guidance that we use to recommend approvals related to off-street parking in the site plan process. Uh, as you know, because you have approved them uh, over the recent years, uh, the Transportation Commission, the Planning Commission, and the Board have uh, on staff recommendation approved projects with parking at uh, rates lower than uh, required in the by right portions of the zoning ordinance um, in accordance with the site plan and use permit provisions of the same zoning ordinance. And this process is really about creating a policy or guidelines that uh, will give more clarity to that existing uh, practice of allowing parking that is uh, approved at rates that are sufficient for the site um, and in uh, consideration of site specific conditions. Uh, our policy making practice was of course informed both by broader policy uh, in the comprehensive plan as well as the expanding range of transportation options in the two metro corridors. And in addition to that backing, uh, we use data on parking demand in the county as well as best practices and current practice in other communities uh, to formulate a policy recommendation. Um, of course, central to that, as, I, as you or know, is the working group itself, which was 11 members. I believe there are two additional members in the audience with us this evening. Um, and then in addition to the working group, which met six times, uh, or I'm sorry, 11 times over the course of six months, we engaged with the public through a variety of in-person uh, and online methods, as well as various presentations to commissions. <coughs> 
Uh, again, I want to point out what both the working group and we as staff see as the potential benefits to the community for this. Uh, we believe that this policy, if enacted, would uh, continue to foster the development of transit-oriented housing in the metro corridors um, by allowing developers to build housing that is uh, geared towards uh, low and no, har no car households. We, uh, we allow for some of the increment of housing that's to be built over the next 12 years to be built with houses that, or households that will uh, use metro, use biking and walking as their primary mode of transportation. Um, we also believe that this policy would, uh, these guidelines would allow for increased housing production and housing choice, um, especially as it relates to committed affordable housing, and it could lower the cost to the county in the form of AHIF contributions to produce those units. Um, finally, we think that this will help create a more predictable approval process, and I always repeat these uh, potential benefits in these presentations because one of the clear messages we've received through the feedback process or through the engagement process is that uh, the perception that this policy is a, a giveaway to the development community and we want to be clear that we think that there are real uh, tangible benefits to the county um, and that it is not some sort of uh, benefit to developers at the expense of residents. In terms of where these uh, guidelines would apply, uh, this map shows in the pink or purple land area the parts of the two metro corridors where the zoning code currently allows multifamily residential by site plan or UCMUD. Um, around those areas, you also see where we have on-street parking management in the form of meters and residential permit parking. Um, you'll see that most of the streets in the two metro corridors are actually managed with that on-street policy, and that's important because as you all stated in your letter to the board, uh, we and we concur that on-street parking policy is the best way to actually manage on-street demand and any potential for spillover because of the different levels of off-street parking. So the central element of this policy and set of guidelines is what you see here, of course, which is a set of new minimum guidelines that are related to a potential project's distance to Metro, and then also uh, the mix of market rate and committed affordable units. Um, as you get further from Metro, the minimum expectation for parking increases. If you are producing more committed affordable units, the minimum requirement declines or goes down. Uh, of course, these are minimums. The developer is free to submit a proposal, as they often do, above these minimums if they so choose, though we do have an excess threshold included in this proposal, uh, such that if a developer proposes parking at more than 1.65 spaces per unit, then uh, they would be required to mitigate that either by placing the parking in a tandem configuration or in stackers or by making a mitigation payment to the county. And this is based on um, evidence from elsewhere corroborated by findings here that cheap and abundant parking uh, attracts more households with more cars, cars that are then driven. I'll also note, going back to the slide before, that we are setting the minimum number of accessible spaces higher than what is actually required in the building code. In this case, we're setting it equal to the number of type A accessible units, which is higher than what is usually required. It's usually a function of the number of spaces provided, not number of units. As we have discussed before, this policy allows uh, greater flexibility than the by right zoning requirements, recent site plan approvals, uh, as well as recently observed parking demand, um, both at committed affordable and uh, market rate projects. Um, I'll take a minute to just uh, highlight the reasons why we have set these rates below recent demand. Um, First, we've set them lower than recent demand because of the phenomena of induced demand and the fact that more parking, especially if it is cheap or uh, subsidized, that will attract more vehicles. So we expect that some of the parking demand is simply because it is attracting households that own more cars. Um, we believe that setting the minimums and uh, below recent demand also allows for a policy that can be flexible with future changes um, and the potential impacts of 
innovations such as autonomous vehicles and perhaps more use of e-commerce than actually making shopping trips in person or at least alleviating the need to make some shopping trips that normally would have required a vehicle for larger packages. Um, we also have seen that while the current rates of uh, zero car households in the county are about 17 to 19%, um, depending on the metro corridor you're in, over recent years, uh, the share of households coming into the county have ranged between 17% and 38% that are zero car households. <clears throat> in the past, the board has spoken about the need to build a transit system for the future and to build a transit system in anticipation of the kind of transit oriented future that we want to see. And we believe that allowing um, a more flexible parking policy also contributes to the creation of a less car intensive uh, metro corridor area. And finally, I'll point out that uh, there is some precedent for setting parking minimums below recent demand in the 1970s and early 80s. Many of the districts in the by right section of the zoning ordinance had their parking ratios lowered um, in anticipation of the further expansion of the metro rail system or in tandem with the uh, installation and opening of the metro rail system. <clears throat> I also want to uh, answer some of the concerns that we've heard from many about the fairness of this policy as it relates to committed affordable units. Um, many have pointed to either hypothetical or families that they know or individuals that they have seen that uh, perhaps work in the construction trades or work in jobs that require them to drive to non-transit accessible locations. And as we've always said, the individual circumstances of a family may vary, but there are multiple reasons why we are allowing or why we are recommending guidelines that would put the minimum requirement for committed affordable lower than market rate. First of all, um, while there are a large number of uh, residents in our committed affordable units who work in the construction trades, about 11%. Actually, more work in the food service and hospitality industries um, and in other professions such as office work and service jobs where transit access actually might be more uh, beneficial than being in a car dependent part of the county. Um, multiple data sources have also shown that here and elsewhere, low income households are less likely to own a vehicle than those with higher incomes. The master transportation plan calls on us to reduce or eliminate minimum parking requirements for uh, affordable units. Um, of course, the cost of that parking itself can make affordable housing uh, less feasible and less likely to be constructed or only at greater expense to the county. Um, and while certainly an affordable unit that is produced with very little parking uh, may not serve the needs of every uh, family that qualifies for a committed affordable unit, we believe that if it serves the needs of at least some families who otherwise would not have an apartment to even choose from, then that is a benefit to the community. Uh, finally, we have inserted as a relation to this concern an element of the policy wherein the management company or the manager of the property would not be able to discriminate or deny, <clears throat> excuse me, deny access to parts of the garage based on whether a family lives in a committed affordable or market rate unit and that they would not be able to charge the committed affordable households more for parking than the market rate households. For context, uh, as I think I shared with you this uh, last time, this is a map of parking minimums in the three core jurisdictions of the region, the District of Columbia, uh, Arlington, and Alexandria. Uh, the lighter areas show land where there are lower parking requirements or no parking requirements, as there is in many parts of the district. Uh, the darker shades indicate land where parking requirements are higher. Uh, the upshot is that this set of guidelines would put us somewhere between the District of Columbia and Alexandria. I'll also add off this map, uh, Tyson's Corner has reduced its parking, or Fairfax has recently reduced its parking requirements for the Tyson's Corner redevelopment area. They are still higher than uh, the requirements would be here under this policy. And I'll add that as of a few weeks ago, Prince George's County has developed a draft zoning code that would actually eliminate parking requirements around the new Carrollton Branch Avenue and other major transit stations in that area. 
to go through a few other elements of the proposal, uh, we would allow developers to exchange a few parking spaces uh, for investment in bike share, bike parking, and car share services, um, or car share spaces with service guarantees of at least three years. Um, some limitations that we put on this, uh, since the working group committed it, completed its work, we said that the minimum parking requirements could not be exchanged by more than 50% under this policy. Also, there could only be one bike share station uh, supported through this mechanism. You couldn't simply support five different bike share stations on your same property. Um, and there would be no exchange permitted of accessible spaces for bike share or bike parking. We have added a visitor parking space requirement to this proposal, which I know uh, gave some concern to members of this commission when we spoke to you all back in August. Uh, the requirement would be 0 0.05 spaces per unit for the first 200 units. It's not for all of the units, um, but this is meant to uh, deal with some of the concern about spillover and in light of the fact that our on-street demand data indicates that demand in these corridors is highest in the evening hours, not overnight, which indicates that visitors uh, coming to the area are the major factor contributing to demand and supply, uh, or demand. Um, the visitor spaces could not be exchanged for bike share, bike parking, or car share. And uh, this could not be located off-site, which is something I'll get to here in a moment. This slide, actually. The policy would build on comprehensive plan policy and sector plan policy that encourages more efficient use of parking resources, both through on-site shared parking or sharing parking spaces between two uses on the same project that demand parking at different times, and then also off-site shared parking so that a building uh, that has excess parking could lease that out or encumber that parking to the other property as long as it's within 800 feet. Um, off-site shared parking would only be possible in structured parking garages within the two metro corridors and visitor and handicap spaces or accessible spaces would not be permitted to be uh, fulfilled through off-site shared parking. Uh, finally, there is a provision for um, special reductions in parking requirements should there be some sort of site condition uh, where uh, building the necessary parking is so impractical that it makes the development of that parcel in accordance with our general land use plan uh, unlikely or impossible. Um, some of the conditions that might uh, prompt a recommendation for a waiver. These requirements include underground utilities, uh, something about the site size or configuration, and so on. Uh, there was a 10% cap on this that the working group recommended, but at the request of the board, we've removed that cap. Of course, as with all the elements of this, these are guidelines and it's still up to county board approval, but to be clear on this, we didn't limit what staff would recommend. There are, as we discussed last time, a few related recommendations. First of these, of course, is to uh, determine whether or not there are some ways in which to streamline the process of shared parking between two site plan or use permit buildings. Uh, there are two related recommendations about on-street parking policy, which, uh, again, you called out in your letter to the board. Um, there is also a uh, uh, request to the board to direct the manager to explore amendments to the RC zoning district. Uh, our policy would not apply to the RC zoning districts unless those are amended to allow the board to modify their parking requirements. It is a district where the board can't uh, modify the parking requirements below one space per unit. Uh, and then some longer term uh, recommendations that we're putting forth that wouldn't be completed at least until after the completion of a review of the RPP program are to take a similar approach or a, another exploration or study of these kinds of policies in our other major planning corridors and then finally perhaps consider some changes to the by right section of zoning ordinance. Our list of next steps grows shorter. So you'll see here that our next presentation on this is planning commission on the 13th, and then we will be presenting to the board at their November meeting. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions following public speakers.
Mr. Best, let's hear from our public speakers. Uh, starting off with uh, Nina Bagley, followed by Ben Diarzano. Hello again. Um, with all the development and things that are happening within Boston, Virginia Square, I will have to tell you that when this issue first came up, when we went to the open house in December, it was a well-discussed and very concerning issue within Boston, Virginia Square. Um, since the start of this study, we have not been in favor of assigning new minimum parking standards as they assume all the affected areas of the county have the same access to public parking facilities. In the Crystal City area, for instance, there are many public parking lots. However, if you look at Ballston, we got one. It's the mall. And Virginia Square, it's the mall. When a developer has the option to start very low with proposed parking standards, we believe it will be far more difficult for us to work out solutions during the SPRC process for new development, which will ensure adequate parking for new residents, especially given our lack of public parking options. Their guests and nearby neighbors as well as encourage walking, biking, public transportation, car sharing, et cetera. To date, no two developments have been the same regarding par parking opportunities as well as challenges, and we believe this will be true moving forward. For instance, Ashton Heights, Bluemont, and BVSCA Civic Associations agreed last year to the then lowest parking ratio approved in Boston for Boston Quarter, formerly Macy's Furniture Store, which was 0.8, only because the county's nearby parking garage has unused space to accommodate resident and guest overflow. Moreover, as we look to the future, within BVSCA, nearly a third of our residents and growing are over 55. While some of the condos at Virginia Square have higher parking standards for residents, guests are forced to find on-street parking, which is already difficult. Is it truly realistic to assume these guests will either park at the mall, use Metro, or Uber, or bike? While we applaud the effort of the county to tackle this very difficult subject, um, we do not feel that the imposed standards are the answer, at least in our neighborhood. As always, we appreciate your consideration of our residents' concerns. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ben uh, Diarzano, followed by Scott um, looks Pallets. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Ben Devonzo. I am a resident of the Clarendon Courthouse neighborhood. Um, Scott, our president, will be speaking about our neighborhood stance briefly. I just wanted to speak from my personal experience um, about this proposal. I've actually been kind of surprised at my concerns that have been risen out of it. I took the survey um, uh, staff presented at our civic association, and, but the more I've thought about it, the kind of more concerns I've had about the really low minimums um, and the standards, uh, the really low minimums, particularly around metro stations, and the standards being proposed for how those minimums can be brought even lower. Um, so from my personal experience, um, I, am, I am a metro user. I don't own a car myself. I am a bike share member, a car to go member, et cetera, et cetera. But my wife is a car user. Um, and so we represent a pretty common, I think, family dynamic in Arlington where you have someone who commutes to DC and someone who commutes to the suburbs in which case using public transportation is not realistic. And I think the kind of vision of the scenario, I, that family doesn't really work. You, you either can be all transit or all car and kind of live in less uh, developed areas. And I think personally, this, this scenario and these kind of point to or one space for every five units doesn't envision families or even one space for every 10 units doesn't envision families um, who live like that, and I think that's really concerning. Um, the other aspect I want to speak to is about the uh, proposed offsets. Um, there's nothing in there about uh, metro funding or ways that developers would use uh, reduced parking spaces to contribute to public transit, and I urge you to really think about that and recommending that as an option or 
as our civic association is recommending, think about just letting SPRC processes go through the actual master process of figuring out what the right offsets should be. I was actually on the SPRC representing our civic association for the Hyatt um, building, and that uh, building does have reduced parking. It's a hotel, of course, not under this um, plan, but similar concept that parking was reduced in that plan, um, and this um, the Transportation Commission approved that, um, and in exchange for a number of things, but in exchange in part for a contribution to a new elevator for the courthouse metro station. Um, it's something that a few other site plans around here have contributed and is now set to be built over the next couple of years. This plan really reduces the flexibility of SPRCs in the future to have those sort of contributions to public transit or other things that the neighborhood um, and staff and the developer might think are more appropriate than a pretty short amount of time for a bike share or th even three years for a car share program that in the lifespan of a building is not a very long time for a trade-off and will then easily go away for something that's, it's a little strange to cut your building's parking in half for something that will last six, three years. Um, so those are two aspects uh, that I really want you all to consider. Thank you very much. Thank Our you. next speaker is Scott Pedowitz, followed by June O'Connell. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Thank you for being out this evening. My name is Scott Pedowitz. I am the president of the Clarendon Courthouse Civic Association and speaking on behalf of that organization. Uh, we are in the process of preparing a letter to send to the board in advance of their meeting. It is still going through drafts, but we uh, identified some concerns that we presented before the request advertised to the board, and we have come up with some proposals that we are gonna to present to mitigate them. I will read them orally and would offer them for your consideration as well. In beginning, I want to note that as we've discussed this with our membership, we have concerns that does not mean we are opposed to the whole concept. We think there's a lot of positive in here. We like that it is forward looking. We like that it is looking for flexibility. To a degree, we are with the concept that oversupply can lead to some induced car demand. And that is why in our earlier letter, we did not object to any of the proposed minima greater than a quarter mile from a metro station. There are about 0.2 spaces per unit below the lowest observed demand. We figure they might be getting at some of that induced demand. But inside of a quarter of a mile, which is a lot of the uh, multi-unit residential buildings in our civic association, those differences from lowest demand that we've seen to the proposed minima get up to 0.4 and 0.5 spaces per unit. And at this point, we are very concerned that this could go beyond the induced demand to cut into real demand, to make it hard, and Ben gave a couple of examples before, for people who really do need cars to live here in the courthouse in Clarendon neighborhoods. And that is why we are going to propose to the board that they set none of the minima lower than 0.5 spaces per unit. So that's one space for every two units. Uh, we note these are all site plans. Uh, we will have an SPRC for all of them. If a developer has a workable plan for less than one space for every two units, how they're gonna mitigate the tra transport need, I wanna hear it. I'm eager to have that discussion. We'll ask questions, we'll challenge assumptions, we'll get to something that can work. We fear that if we go with the 0 0.2, 0 0.3 ratios, we run the risk of having them come and say, well, we're with policy, end of discussion. The second concern we raise relates to the trade-offs for bike share, bike parking, and car share. And we have two concerns with them. The first is that despite multiple times asking, we've yet to get a sense that these are based on a real study of how much of these amenities are needed to get people to give up their cars. Um, so if we knew that having X number of bike share stations or X amount of car share led to a reduction in private vehicle ownership, that's a, a worthwhile trade-off. We don't feel we're there yet, so we're not against the idea of the trade-off, but 
we're gonna propose to the board that we make that more of a conceptual item, that we could have these trade-offs, let's go through SPRCs, let's do more study, make sure it's working, that we don't get caught out with a bad ratio there. Secondly, and Ben alluded to this a moment ago, a lot of people who live here car-free, and this includes me, I've been here 10 years without a car, feel comfortable doing that because of transit, because of metro rail, metro bus, art bus, none of these trade-offs relate to transit infrastructure. And so we would like to see the flexibility perhaps to build a bus shelter. Ben gave some other examples as well. That's not envisioned in the plan. We're gonna recommend to the board that they add that as a potential vehicle, again, to be decided in a site plan review process. And that brings me to the third and final concern that we have, and it's one that really motivates all of this. And that is, a week ago tonight, we discussed this topic in our meeting, and just spontaneously in the room, people raised why they have and need cars. Ben gave the example of a mixed couple where one spouse needs to drive and one needs to use Metro. We had a number of seniors talk about the need for vehicles for shopping. Or even today, one of uh, my neighbors called me up and said, I worry that we're signaling to seniors that they're not welcome, they can't come if they don't have a car. I worry that if we focus exclusively on people like me who feel comfortable living car free, we run the risk of losing diversity in this neighborhood. Diversity is what makes our neighborhood great. It's why we live here. And I wanna make sure that we preserve that for residents of Clarendon Courthouse and the two metro corridors in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is uh, June O'Connell followed by Alexandra Belke. Give me a minute. It's Tall people night. Um, good evening. I uh, I am June O'Connell. I've lived in First Colonial Village and now in the courthouse for 30 years. Uh, I agree with the preceding speakers about the concerns with the policies. Uh, particularly, I am concerned with that. Unlike the office policy, there is no financial. Uh, buy down in the structure. So the, uh, the office policy creates, you reduce parking, you give a contribution to um, some kind of transit infrastructure. There's no mechanism for that kind of mechanism here. I also believe that the two, point two and the point four are too low because people have varying needs. But I want to address um, kind of specific things that I would like you to put in your letter to the manager and instructions to the county board. I ask that you ensure that the county is adopting a county-wide policy without expedient cut cutouts and that is transparent in its embrace of unbuilt site plans. The report should contain examples of how the, p the penalty will work and explain the basis for the one point six five. Just what amount of parking would trigger this penalty? Should you, um, should you want to assure your, you should want to assure yourselves that the penalty is, let, is set so that it will actually deter and isn't so far out there that no developer would ever trigger it. Um, there should be an actual example of how this would play out, and I would suggest a block like the Wells Fargo Bach in Clarendon, where you say, if it has 200 units, this is how many parking it would probably get. And then I think that it should be compared to the previously approved site plan at Red Top and uh, across the street. And I want to emphasize that this policy impacts not new site plans, but all unbuilt site plans. So a site plan like Red Cab could come in the day after it's, this policy is approved and reduce its parking from 463 for 580 units to what? 100, 150, and they wouldn't have to contribute the 3 million that they have pledged to do. So if I'm a businessman and I'm a lawyer in this county, I'm gonna encourage applicants to rethink those site plans. And I do not believe that that has been transparently laid out here. Um, I think that it hasn't been clear why East Falls Church is not in the plan, and it's not even in tasking five for studying Co Columbia Pike and um, uh, uh, Lee Highway. And I think it, 
it should be clear in this report and in the policy why those exceptions have been made. Thank you for your attention. I didn't get to everything. Thank you, Ms. O'Connell. Our next speaker is Alexandria uh, Belke. Belinsky. Um, I hope all, all commissioners have my handouts because it's essential. Um, my name is Alexander Belinsky, and uh, I'm Arlington resident, and um, I'm also a professional information consultant. And this is a short uh, search which I think could give a local audience what happened seven years ago about exactly when county made decision uh, to adopt uh, parking uh, in cold ma management elements. And uh, this is uh, just who is, uh, uh, don't have handouts, this is a link to handouts with all live link. Next slide, please. This is a, a screenshot from a uh, staff presentation, and it was interesting just for, for sense what was there. This, it, it was a view of the off-site of street pro parking from the neighborhood perspective to consider existing uh, parking uh, pa parking capabilities. And uh, it's interesting, even affordable housing here is a way how to achieve this using, afford using parking at night. Ne next slide, please. So parking ratio, as it was proposed, is well known. <coughs> it's a combination of TDM and addition, uh, it was a requirement of developers to study existing parking requirements based, as it was written, upon expected needs. Next slide, please. Um, and at the same time, it was objection from uh, NIOP, and they say that when this uh, policy um, accepted, parking ratio should be a key of this policy, and it should be based on ranges to proximity to mass transit. The next slide show the staff response. They don't concur at that time. And uh, they say that, um, uh, so in more details, they say that uh, they would not postpone uh, the site approval, et cetera, until the study would be made. In the uh, final, uh, final slide, it's a um, board response. Uh, it was a request for deferral of, of the developers of this meeting but go, board decided to go ahead. In fact, in it enforced the provision study parking requirement with also study TDM measures. Uh, and uh, finally, it's not related to this provision. Board uh, decided that no a community process should not be planned until board would not notify it. And uh, this is taking lesson. We move, uh, we, we just forget what, what was decided at uh, that time in trying to solve this problem from the very beginning. Thank you for your attention. And that concludes our speakers for this item. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, I just want to thank everyone for coming out and speaking. Um, we always appreciate community input. We don't get nearly as much of it here as the board does. Um, uh, who wants to kick things off with questions or comments? Commissioner Weir. Um, <clears throat> I just want to observe one thing, and that is that uh, I, I noted during the staff presentation that these proposals would place Arlington between uh, the District of Columbia and the City of Alexandria. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to observe that of those three jurisdictions, Arlington is the least densely populated. Uh, Alexandria is, uh, and the district are both about 16 to 20 percent. Uh, more densely populated than um, <clears throat> than Arlington is, uh, which is just an interesting note as to um, parking mi uh, minimums. Other commissioner questions or thoughts? I, I just want, oh, Commissioner Garrett. No, I just wanted to uh, express some concern about the minimums and reducing things too much. Uh, sometimes we, uh, I, I mean, I, my concern, and I agree with uh, the statements of a number of the speakers, uh, number one, about 
where we are reducing, getting something back in return. Uh, Chris Zimmerman, uh, when he was on the county board, used to make the comment that somebody's got to pay for the seat on the bus. I mean, running the extra buses, metro improving service, uh, the money's got to come from somewhere. And if you're going to uh, reduce parking, particularly in the corridor, uh, somebody's got to pay for the enhanced service. Um, another concern is, uh, and, and one of the speakers alluded to this too, are we, by implication, creating a bias against um, multi-adult adult households where people work in different places and may choose to live in the corridor for a number of reasons, but do need two cars to get to work or uh, because they do have to make house calls once or twice a day, they need that other car, but can't live here for that reason. Is, is, do we want to restrict things so much that they can't live here? Um, third concern is demographics sometimes change. Um, and uh, with, according to some of the, the latest statistics, millennials starting to move out of the area, who is going to fill apartments in some of the areas uh, where a lot of millennials live, let's say like in Clarendon? Uh, it may well be that as the, uh, the, the baby boomer population ages, they find this attractive housing, but they still need cars for one thing or another. They can't get on a bicycle and go someplace. Their store, their, their trips are, consist largely, let's say, of getting to the grocery store, but it's not practical to bring things home on the metro from the grocery store, particularly if there isn't a grocery store within a, a short walk to where they are. Right now, there are, we're fairly well served, served by grocery stores, but we may not be in the future. Uh, another issue is visitor parking, and, and when you tighten up the parking available, uh, where do the visitors go? I think it's a practical matter. It's almost impossible for visitors to get in any of our existing buildings uh, just because the parking access is pretty tightly controlled, particularly in apartment buildings, and uh, they wind up on the street. Um, and, and again, to the extent you reduce your parking requirements and you've got the residents themselves parking on the streets, there's no parking for the visitors. Uh, final point is retail. Uh, and we have made a strenuous effort in the corridor to encourage and even require a lot of ground floor retail. Uh, retail depends in part on, on people who are outside the area and would need to drive to get to that retail. To the extent that your, uh, your, your parking is parked up in the evening, uh, particularly if you're, you're concerned about restaurants, uh, by people who live in the buildings themselves, uh, that parking will not be available for turnover or for retail, particularly after six o'clock. And uh, so I, I think there are a number of concerns in terms of looking forward that uh, this may be going overboard and we may be creating problems for ourselves down the road. I mean, you know, each generation tends to kind of assume, seems, seems to go in a direction towards doing something, and then the next generation comes along and realizes the mistakes, and I hope we're not, we're not doing that with this. So that's my comment. Um, so, I'm gonna say, I, I, first off, I, I strongly support basically everything that is in this proposal. Um, largely because, first off, what we're talking about are minimums, not maximums. What we're talking about are minimums, not requirements. Um, you know, if not having a parking space for every residential unit is going to se severely curtail the market for those units, then no sane developer is going to do that. Um, and I know often the concern there is, oh, well, they're just gonna do it and assume that people can go out and park on the street. Um, and to that, I would say the best way to manage on-street demand is to manage on-street demand, to have on-street on parking policy. Um, one thing that we have learned, I think, in Arlington over the years is that it does, 
you could build five parking spaces per unit in a residential building, and if people and if you charge for those spaces, but there's a free spot two blocks down, somebody is going to go park in that free spot on the street two blocks down, even though there are five parking spaces per unit in the residential unit. Um, I will say the the concern that I am most um, choose my words carefully here <laughs> um, that that I find most sympathetic is that we should be asking for some sort of buy down that um, we will certainly be making uh, our buildings cheaper to build and we will we hope strongly and expect to some extent that that will result in cheaper rents or that it will result in more housing being built that wouldn't have built been built before, that it will make some projects suddenly viable that were not viable when they had to build that many parking spaces. Um, but I think everybody recognizes that to some extent, uh, it will just result in more profit for the person building the building. And uh, I, am, <laughs> I am certainly sympathetic to Mr. Zimmerman's point that somebody has to pay for that spot on the bus, that yes, you know, having people drive on our roads has a cost to the county that has to be borne, but also having people take our transit has a cost to the county that has to be borne. Um, and so if we require them to build parking spaces for the people who are driving, shouldn't we require them to do something for the people that are taking transit? Um, but with that said, this is the this is where the working group got to um, after a lot of deliberation and a lot of careful thought and a lot of weighing uh, multiple viewpoints. And so at this point, I'm comfortable um, and enthusiastic in supporting the uh, policy as outlined. Other commission? Commissioner Perkins. Mr. Chairman, I served on this um, working group and I'd like to thank my colleagues on the working group for what I thought was a very uh, thoughtful process that involved us uh, reviewing a lot of data and presentations um, and this process was lengthy and it involved a lot of careful scrutiny of the data that we have available, some of which was better quality than others. So I wanted to state that um, Parking minimums are one of the places where the government has kind of the heaviest hand in our economy um, in terms of basically forcing people to buy expensive products that they don't necessarily need. Um, a parking space built underneath a building in Arlington can cost $60,000 or more, which when you think about the construction cost of a one bedroom apartment can be something like 30 or 40% of the cost of building the apartment. So these aren't small amounts of money that we're asking people to spend on building a parking space that they may or may not need. Um, so this increases the cost of building housing. This is a very expensive area and we're dealing with a housing affordability problem here in Arlington. So I think that to the extent that we can alleviate the cost that, it, that people are being asked to pay for a building, um, that can help out with the housing affordability problem. Um, that said, this new policy that's being proposed does not require the building to reduce um, the parking down to the bare minimum that's allowed by the county. Um, buildings have to be marketable and during the meetings that we had with our residential parking working group, uh, a lot of times the um, people that were representing the developer community stated that even if the n numbers were this low, um, most of the time they would find it very hard to build and market a building with um, a parking requirements this low. So I, I found that it was generally unlikely that we would see the majority of buildings built this low. And in fact, for a lot of buildings, they said that just the economics of how you can market a building that's a condo as opposed to an apartment. You know, a condo building, there's the expectation when people buy a condo unit that they generally buy a parking space as part of their condo unit. And so for the ones that the developer was intending to build and market as a condo unit, we might even see them build one-to-one -one as the parking ratio or something very close to that. So I think that even though the numbers on this 
presentation state 0 0.2 or 0 0.4, um, it's not that every single building would be built in that manner. Um, I think that if you build buildings with very low parking ratios, that we do need to make sure that we get the on-street parking policy right, because having off-street parking requirements that require the builder to build a minimum, the origin of that was during a time before parking meters and before the laws that allowed people to have a resident permit uh, program. And so this was basically the only manner that a city had to make sure that the streets were not clogged with cars was to basically force a developer to build parking for people so that they wouldn't just leave their cars everywhere. Now that we have the tools, um, since 1975, Arlington's had a resident permit parking program. We have, uh, in essence, I think the first resident permit parking program in the United States. We took this permit park program to court to defend it. And I think it is one of the more successful programs in the United States. Um, in addition, the invention of the parking meter has made it so that we can regulate how people use parking on the street for a short term. I think that if we get those programs working well as the staff has proposed to evaluate them, that a reduction in the need to regulate how much parking people um, build at significant cost can happen. Um, in terms of metro contributions, um, it has been several years since I did the calculation, but at one point I did a calculation where I attributed people's metro fares to the jurisdictions that they came from, and what I and in a in a way saying, how much do the people who live in Arlington contribute towards metros? operating cost, how much do the people who live in Fairfax County or Prince George's County or the District of Columbia? And what if we were to redo how the jurisdictions had to pay, you know? And what I found was that Arlington and the District of Columbia, the people who live in Arlington and District of Columbia basically fully support Metro in terms of how much it costs to run Metro in Arlington. And so by providing more buildings where people can live and are encouraged to ride Metro by having, let's say, less parking available than fully, you know, one car per adult, I think that is part of Arlington's contribution to Metro, which is basically transit-oriented living supports Metro. Um, so I think that's saying a lot, but I also would just say that I, I um, thought that the working group came to something that I can support and that I, I, I would feel happy supporting this. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Price. Just I want to first congratulate Mike I, and Jim and staff on this report. I think it's fantastic. I think the policy is absolutely pushing Arlington in the right direction. Um, but to talk about the issue of regarding the buy down or getting money, extracting money out of potential future developers uh, for things like metro stop and bus stops. Has that, was that discussed during the deliberations and what, what, was the, what happened, what occurred, and was it just mixed, bad idea, good idea? In some ways it was, the site plan process inherently always includes some discussion of what is done with in transit infrastructure immediate to the property. So we did not have a discussion. Um, well, I'm not recalling to what degree we had a discussion about that with the working group, but I think uh, some of staff's uh, consternation around this issue since we've been talking with the public about it has been, but there's always a discussion about whether or not there's some sort of improvement to pedestrian, bicycle, and transit infrastructure around the property. So we haven't tied it directly to the parking in this policy, but it would still happen as part of the site plan process. Um, Mr. Chairman, I can say that when I came to the resident parking working group, that was my initial reaction was that we were looking to see a fair process by which we can take a developer who's looking at spending $60,000 on building a parking space and basically figuring out what fraction of that value we can extract out of them and get, 
you know, basically a spending on transit oriented um, benefits for the community or whatnot. After thinking about it more and thinking about the cost of housing in our area and the cost of affordable housing, I think that in contrast with the commercial parking working group, which does have that sort of proffer, we don't have a policy for affordable housing for commercial. Like we don't have, we don't have businesses that are, you know, not able to um, to live anywhere because uh, unaffordable housing. Um, but I think that in terms of being able to find people places to live and for people to be able to afford places to live, that a different approach was necessary that didn't involve extracting some of the value. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Commissioner Weir. Uh, following up somewhat on Ms. Commissioner Price's question, uh, Mr. Krim, you you point you went right to talking about site plan. Uh, what about by right development? Is is by right development something that happens much in these areas? Uh, and if it is, is uh, does it happen enough that we should be thinking about uh, buy downs in by right? I'm going to pass this to Mr. Leach. I was going to mention in, in my tenure with the county, um, we have seen very little by right development in the metro corridors. Almost everything that's coming through the pipeline is by site plan or use permit. I thought that might be the answer, but I wanted to know. How much of the development that we're seeing is only site plan because they need some sort of um, concession on parking that no one would do a by right if they were required to build? 1.125 to 1 as required by the code. I think it's, I, th I think the reasons why the development community goes site plan are broader than that. Um, that um, it is uh, providing more program on the site. It is allowing for more flexible design, better design. Um, our um, by right is basically 1950s Euclidean zoning and it produces a bad suburban pattern by and large. Um, and fortunately, our development community isn't there. They want to produce good urban mixed-use projects. Thank you. I, I do want to ask a question that was brought up by uh, Ms. O'Connell during public uh, testimony. Why is East Falls Church not included in this? Uh, the reasons are that while this uh, East Falls Church is around a metro station, but um, it has not had the general land use planning or transportation infrastructure that the Roslyn Boston portion of the corridor has had. So uh, it is served by Metro, but you know it has a park and ride lot. It is certainly of lower density, and it's seen that the Roslyn Boston corridor was more similar uh, in the way that the transportation system and land use patterns have developed than uh, East Falls churches in comparison. Um, also, of course, there's much more uh, interest and activity in terms of development in the Roslyn Boston portion or more you know, land to be developed at higher density. Thank you. Anything else? I move that the Transportation Commission adopt the off-street parking policy for multifamily, sorry, I move that the Transportation Commission recommend that the county board adopt <laughs> the off-street parking policy for multifamily residential projects approved by special exception in the Roslyn, Boston and Jefferson Davis Metro corridors and related recommendations as set forth in attachment one. Additionally, I move that the county board, sorry, I had the page Correct the and I lost it. Yeah. It has the page number for the direct the county manager to blah section. Oh, I think I can find that here. Um, it's on page 19. Thank you. Other recommendations? In addition, we recommend that the county board direct the county manager to explore options for streamlining the approval process for shared parking arrangements between two site plan or just going to say UCMUD because I don't remember what it stands for, projects, that we recommend the county board direct the county manager to review and recommend improvements to the residential permit parking program. 
that we recommend that the county board direct the county manager to review the county's on-street parking meter fees and hours of operation. And we recommend that the county board direct the county manager to explore amendments to the RC district provisions of the zoning ordinance. And we recommend that the county board direct the county manager to explore a similar policy for site plans and use permits in the Columbia Pike and Lee Highway areas. And that we recommend that the county board direct the county manager to explore amendments to the by right minimum parking requirements in the zoning ordinance designed to implement the provisions of the proposed policy. Mr. Chairman, before we continue, before you second, may I ask staff another question about the inclusion of uh, Columbia Pike and Lee Highway? Can we quickly see if there's a second? I'm sorry, sec I right. will second. Go ahead and ask your question. Like, why provision number five? Why include Lee Highway in, in this recommendation? Just Are what's you, the thought process behind of the uh, for including it? Well, I mean, I think in general it's because if we've gone ahead and done this much work now for these two metro areas, at some point it's probably a good idea simply to look at how we're approaching it in other parts of the county where the county has visions for um, not density as high as in the metro corridors, but certainly more than single family detached. Um, so we've also heard interest from um, others in the community of like, well, why aren't you paying this kind of attention to our area? Or there's opportunity and a lot of vision around Columbia Pike. There, of course, is in the works study of the Lee Highway area. So with um, both the work that's gone before on Columbia Pike and potentially in the future with Lee Highway, we at least want to put on record the idea that we should look at this uh, in those areas. Um, and you there's would consider really no this would be part of their, of the planning process that will eventually at some point in the future occur on Lee Highway as part of the Lee Highway visioning study? The, the future that broadly speaking, the timing may not work such that it can be folded into the Lee Highway process. It could be, but our main limiting step right now is getting through a review of the RPP program that, as we said at our August work session with the board, will likely take until the summer of 2019. So to the extent that the Lee Highway process is faster than us, we don't want to slow that down. Yep. Um, but you know, we're only two floors away from CPHD. So uh, to the extent that we can provide input or they can provide us input back based on what they've talked about with the community, that could of course could be inputs for um, a more concentrated par process on parking. So I mean, in an ideal world, yes, it would be part of a larger planning process for Lee Highway, but I can't guarantee that given like work plans and timing. Yeah, and I'll point out that says explore a similar No, yeah, policy. no, I, I understand. Um, Not implement in exactly the same policy. Also that since none of the areas on Lee Highway or um, Columbia Pike are adjacent to a metro station, we would only be looking at the highest category of reduction. Correct. Right. Any discussion of the motion? Further discussion of the motion? All right, all those in favor? That's seven, opposed, that's one. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you everyone who came out and offered their input. The next item is item number seven, 67 uh, 11 Lee Highway site plan. Uh, this is a site plan action. I'll turn it over to the uh, applicant's uh, council. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the commission. My name is Matt Roberts with the law firm of Bean, Kinney and Corman. I'm here tonight representing the applicant and we're very excited to be here discussing the major site plan amendment to site plan number three with you. Uh, as you know from our information item hearing a couple months ago, this application involves both a request to rezone the site to the CO district, I'm sorry, to the RA 818 district from the CO district, uh, as well as amend site plan number three to prevent a townhouse development on the site. 
Next slide, please. Just very quickly to orient you to the site, uh, we are located at the intersection of Lee Highway and North Underwood Street, uh, as well as very near the intersection of Lee Highway and Washington Boulevard, just to the south of the site. Uh, for a little bit more context, we're approximately a half mile from the East Falls Church Metro Station. As you can see in the diagram in front of you, uh, we have the Charles A. Stewart Park located uh, to our west, single family housing across the street on Underwood, the Fenwick Court townhouse community to our south uh, on the adjacent property line, uh, as well as the various commercial and retail uses that are located across Lee Highway from this site. Next slide, please. The site is currently developed with a SunTrust Bank uh, site. Uh, there are, as you can see in the diagram in front of you, the site does not currently operate in probably the optimal manner you, you'd want from a transportation perspective. There are four curb cuts located on the site, two on Lee Highway, uh, as well as two on North Underwood Street. There's a large surface parking lot on site with approximately 73 spaces. And if you were to go and view the sidewalks and landscaping area today, there's not much landscaping area at all uh, and approximately five foot sidewalks on both frontages. Next slide, please. Before we get into uh, some of the ways we've laid out the site since the commission last saw it, I do want to highlight two major changes that we've done in light of SPRC. When the commission last saw this project, uh, the units were oriented on the site as you see them on the left. And one of the major changes that we've done in response to SPRC comments and to better bring in line uh, the project with the East Falls Church plan is we've both flipped the units so that they face directly onto North Underwood Street and we've also rotated an internal stick of units away from Fenwick Court and so that they run parallel to Lee Highway. Uh, this does two things. First, uh, on North Underwood Street, we're now able to create that residential edge along the Build 2 line that's called for in the East Falls Church plan. Uh, so this makes North Underwood Street a lot more like the Lee Highway frontage. It puts those doors and, and steps directly out onto the street. The other thing we've done by rotating the units uh, nearest to Fenwick Court is we've, is we've been able to open up the views for, that, uh, for our Fenwick Court neighbors, uh, at least for two, two or three units uh, adjacent to the site. So now instead of looking into the rears uh, of these units, they're going to be looking you know, deeper into the site. It allows more light and air uh, into their units. Next slide, please. But outside of that, the project still continues to propose 27 townhouse units. We are approximately 16 units per acre. Uh, we plan to accomplish that, as I mentioned before, by both a rezoning to the R818 district, uh, which is in line with the East Falls Church plan. The GLUP, in fact, calls for the site to be low, medium residential, uh, and the uh, East Falls Church plan calls for the site to permit townhouse development. Um, the site plan amendment that we've asked for is the requirement to go from a bank site to a townhouse development as we're proposing with this plan. Um, as before, the units are roughly 22 feet by 50 feet. 14 of those are front-loaded units, meaning that you enter uh, into the unit on the same side that your garage is uh, located. And the 13 units that are located along the uh, main frontages of the site along Lee Highway and North Underwood Street are rear-loaded units. So that way we're able to put the residential entrance along the major street frontages while maintaining uh, garages in the backs of each unit. Uh, in addition, because of, the, because of the size of these units, you're able to park two cars in each garage directly. Nothing gets stuck uh, in the driveway. So, you know, you're not dealing with people unable to get across the sidewalks from unit to unit. Uh, we're also including 10 additional visitor parking spaces on site, as you saw before the information item hearing. Again, to accommodate things that are more common in a townhouse development, visitors uh, dealing with deliveries and things such as that. Next slide, please. I do very briefly want to walk you through some of the site architecture, uh, which we've refined pretty heavily through the SPRC process. Um, when the commission previously saw you know, uh, this development, again, we were proposing units that were inward facing along North Underwood Street as opposed to uh, facing outwardly. With the change in terms of flipping the unit, we've now, uh, we've now created a situation where, as called for in the East Falls Church plan, both Lee Highway and Underwood are full brick uh, along the major frontages, including the sides of each unit, uh, all the way up through into the gables. Um, 
that is also true for any end unit that you'd see along the major frontages. So both at this intersection where you're looking at with Lee Highway and Underwood Street, brick all the way up and through the unit. Uh, and if you were to go up along North Underwood Street, as you can see in some of the uh, sketches adjacent to this, there's brick again going all the way up. So we're maintaining uh, the same facade as you, as you come around the major street frontages. Internal to the site, uh, there's a mixture of materials with brick going up to the first floor separated by a band into hardy plank siding as you continue to go up the unit. Um, again, some separation between us and Fenwick Court. There's a large retaining wall that we will be replacing with this development, uh, going from basically a wood structure to uh, stone over top of an aluminum fencing to kind of create that separation and distance. One thing we highlighted for the commission last time and continues to be the case with this development is there is a private pathway that exists between Fenwick Court and this project that gets you into Charles A. Stewart Park. Uh, currently, if you're in Fenwick Court, you have to walk up a flight of steps to our site and then cross into the park. With the regrading of the site that's going to occur, we're gonna actually be able to bring that placement down to the Fenwick Court side so that instead of having to walk up into our site and coming over into the park, they'll simply be able to walk to the path from their site at grade. We'll continue to have a set of steps though for you know, interparcel access to and from Underwood Street. Next slide, please. With this project, we're providing a pretty heavy revision to the streetscapes in the area, all, all in accordance with the East Falls Church area plan. Uh, most immediately, you can see we're gonna be eliminating the two Lee Highway curb cuts. Uh, we're also gonna be providing internal private streets uh, that are roughly between 23 and 26 feet in any given place. Uh, that's a requirement of the fire marshal as we discussed at the information item hearing. And as you can see, we have to have the ability to bring in uh, a truck with a ladder uh, that's able to service these, uh, you know, uh, these units in the event of an emergency. So we have to provide those turnarounds. Um, we're also making pretty substantial uh, revisions to both the sidewalk network on the major frontages, which we'll see in the next slides. So the next slide, please. Very quickly, this is just a cross-section of our proposed Lee Highway. In this cross-section, you wanna look from center to right of the center line. Uh, and as you can see, what we're providing uh, is additional right-of-way and landscaping area behind the curb line, which is what's called for in the East Falls Church Plan. Next slide, please. Slightly different visual of that, we will be providing, uh, taking the right-of-way and landscaping area from seven and a half feet, roughly, if you were to add it all up today, to 19 feet in total between the back of the curb, uh, and I'm sorry, the, the curb to the building face. So we're increasing that sidewalk to eight feet. We're adding a six foot tree furniture zone uh, nearest to Lee Highway, as well as a five foot planting strip between the sidewalk and the units. Next slide, please. Similarly on Underwood, in this uh, cross section, you wanna look center to left. Uh, and again, we're similarly add adding the right of way and landscaping area behind the curb. Next slide. On this side of uh, North Underwood Street, the East Falls Church plan calls for a five foot tree and furniture zone, six foot sidewalk, and a five foot planting strip between the sidewalk and the face of the buildings. Uh, again, if you were to go out there today, it's really just the six foot sidewalk. So a, a pretty large improvement for the public right away. Next slide, please. As we discussed at the information item hearing, the site is pretty well served by alternative transit modes. Um, there are three bus stops in the immediate vicinity of the site, one occurring directly on the property line. Um, we're again within a half mile of the East Falls Church Metro, and as many of you know, there's a pretty substantial bike network in the area. We will be providing on-site bike facilities, you know, bike racks, things of that nature. Next slide, please. This slide you know, summarizes for you some of the items we've just discussed, but I do wanna highlight some major things that do occur with this project uh, in terms of traffic impact. At the adjacent intersections that we were requested by staff to study as part of the scoping study, uh, we found in our, our TIA that this will continue to operate at acceptable levels of service, and in fact, there's a net positive in terms of the number of trips generated when you go from the bank uh, to the townhouse development, particularly at the worst intersect, the worst operating intersection at North Underwood and Lee Highway. Uh, so the levels of service that you see on the screen in front of you currently, the F and E, exist regardless of this project. And in fact, when you add this project into the background, we're reducing AM peak trips by 74% and PM peak trips by roughly 67%. So while the level of service doesn't change, it certainly does not get worse with this project. Uh, and in terms of TMP and the conditions, we continue to work through the site plan conditions with staff, uh, but we do intend to commit to the standard TDM conditions. And so with that, 
uh, thank you very much for your time, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you to staff for the presentation. Hi, I'm Jane Kim with DES Transportation, and this is just a brief uh, staff overview of the site plan amendment. Uh, just as background, the site area is approximately 1.7 acres, and uh, with, there is a rezoning um, request with this amendment from CO to RA 818. Um, there will be 27 fee simple townhouses uh, with building heights ranging from 41 to 46 six feet um, and they are providing um, four additional visitor parking spaces than the required six um, per the 2.2 requirement I think we all know where the site is located and the context and Matt did a great job talking about the design so the main guiding uh, principal document for this project was the East Falls search area plan which was approved in 2011 and I know this is a little bit difficult to read, but it talks a little bit about the, uh, I f I'm focusing my presentation here on uh, recommendation 24 and 25, which speaks to the pedestrian um, network that will involve the frontage of the site on Lee Highway. Um, so this map shows uh, the site circled in, in the yellow color and the, t the intersection of North Underwood and Lee Highway is highlighted as a potential signalized uh, pedestrian crossing. And uh, you can see that with the arrows to the south of the site, that there's a pedestrian pathway um, through that property, G, which is the Verizon site towards the metro station. Um, here's another graphic. So currently there's an informal walking path from our site and areas north um, across Lee Highway, either at a uh, crosswalk at um, Sycamore or Washington or illegally crossing somewhere in between through the private property um, on the Verizon site, through their parking lot, and then you get to Washington Boulevard and either cross legally at a marked crosswalk or illegally across Washington Boulevard to get then to the metro station. Um, that path is approximately, uh, let me see, uh, a tenth of a mile shorter than the, uh, the solid red line path, which is, which is on sidewalks and marked crosswalks um, down Sycamore. And uh, so it's the difference of about 0.4 miles versus 0.5 if you use uh, marked crosswalks, so about two minutes of walking difference. Um, but it is a very important path to the neighborhood and one that was brought up through the SPRC process. Um, uh, however, <laughs> there is no pedestrian infrastructure signalization um, being proposed with this project. The, the project itself, 27 townhouse units, doesn't generate enough pedestrian traffic to warrant such um, a change to Lee Highway. Additionally, adding a pedestrian crossing just on the Lee Highway frontage um, does not resolve both the use of private property as a walking path, nor does it then give a logical direct act cro crossing at Washington Boulevard, which would be you know, even further beyond the nexus of this project. And so, you know, we look forward to the Verizon property coming in for a site plan in the, in the future and addressing this pedestrian situation at that time. But it was a concern that had been brought up um, by the neighborhood, so I wanted to uh, touch upon it tonight. And then finally, um, some of the key transportation or DES-related conditions. Um, are highlighted for you here. If you have any specific questions about these, I'm available to answer them. And um, I have highlighted the staff recommendation for the Transportation Commission to recommend approval to the County Board. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Mr. Best, do we have any speakers on this item? We have no speakers on this item. All right, thank you. Commissioner, question, uh, Mr. Commissioner Perkins, do you want to speak to this at all? You are our SPRC rep for this. I was the member of the SPRC that was on this process. Um, most of the changes that came out of SPRC were architectural or in the case of the stick of townhomes, it was aligning the um, townhomes along Underwood. I will note that when you change, I learned something during SPRC, and that is when you change a townhouse from front-loaded to back-loaded, it actually affects how marketable that uh, unit is, because now instead of being able to market um, a townhouse that has a backyard or a patio or something like that, it now does not. So um, so it was actually at, cost, at some amount of cost that the um, applicant agreed to change this for us. Um, he also agreed to change the exterior look of the, the units and other things. Um, there weren't that many transportation related items that came up other than uh, my strong desire to have a signalized pedestrian intersection and many questions that resulted for why we cannot do that at that time. Um, the only other transportation related issue was a general neighborhood concerned that the bank's parking lot is generally used to support the extreme amount of soccer playing children at Charles A. Stewart Park immediately adjacent to that. So there is some amount of neighborhood concern that removing a unpoliced uh, parking lot from the area will be bad. Um, and to which I say I don't really have much of a response other than that parking lot didn't really belong to us. How many spaces place. was that lot? Uh, well, you can see from the, pre it was probably 20 or 30, um, so it, it was quite a bit. Um, the policy that we have for parking at parks is that people can park along the block face that adjoins the park, and then on Saturdays and Sundays, the um, streets in the area are not really a part of any RPP zone, so they are free for all, so. Thank you for that. So that's all we had out of the SPRC. Uh, my question is, uh, the East Falls Church sector plan calls for eventually, hopefully, getting to some sort of bike infrastructure on Lee Highway. Um, does this, as designed, does this development support that eventuality, assuming a bunch more development in the future, or does it forestall that from ever happening? Um, this development does not change the uh, right-of-way width, so we should be able to um, accommodate bicycle infrastructure in the future. That type of change would um, necessitate looking at all the lane markings, obviously, across Lee Highway, and uh, there's enough, there's sufficient width there depending on how many, you know, lanes we're going to have, so we are um, confident that we can fit something in if in the future that's what's going to happen along the entire corridor. We have enough right of way. We don't need to be acquiring more yes. here. Okay, great. Any other questions? I move that the Transportation Commission recommend the county board um, adopt the attached resolution to approve the subject request for rezoning from CO mixed use district to RA 818 multiple family dwelling district and to update the ACZO map 13-1 to indicate the zoning district and to remove line A around the property boundary from the property known as 6711 Lee Highway and adopt the attached ordinance to approve an amendment to site plan number three to permit development of 27 townhouse dwelling units with modifications of zoning ordinance requirements for reduced street, side, and rear yard setbacks, increased lot coverage, increased building height, and other modifications as necessary to achieve the proposed development plan as outlined in our draft board report dated November 18th, 2017. Seconded. Any discussion? May I ask what line A is? <laughs> <laughs> Jane, sorry. If you read my recommendation, it just says to reflect the subject <laughs> rezoning. <laughs> so I think it's just to clean it up. I don't know exactly. All right. I can get back to you if you would like. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Any additional discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you very <laughs> much. Yeah. Apologies for the late hour. No, I did both. It was they were both on my motion. I promise. I pretty pretty promise. 
There was parts. There was parts about 27 townhouse dwelling units and all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> Our next item is item number eight, the Crystal Square Retail Site Plan. This is a site plan info item. I'll turn it over to the applicant for a brief presentation. Given, given the lateness of the hour, I think I'll get started uh, as my presentation loads. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, my name is Kedrick Whitmore. I'm with Venable, and I uh, represent the applicant uh, for this matter, JBG Smith. Um, this project before you this evening is an informational item related to development on the square block in Crystal City. It is the first of two projects that you're going to see in this area in the coming months. It's great timing. Um, on the next slide, You'll see the block highlighted there in blue in the context of Crystal City and the uh, larger surrounding area. The next slide zooms in a little more closely. You can see that the block is bounded on the west by Jefferson Davis Highway, on the south by 18th Street, on the east by Crystal Drive, and on the north uh, by 15th Street. There are five existing buildings on the block, four of which are office buildings owned by the applicant. Uh, you can also see that both the existing metro station on the uh, upper left side of this shot, as well as the proposed metro station at 18th Street and Crystal Drive uh, are located on the block and will be located on the block. Uh, we see this block as a really key element in the overall development of Crystal City. Before the true vision of the sector plan can be realized, there need to be certain changes to Crystal City to help generate the kind of interest and excitement necessary for large-scale change. And we feel like this block can be a huge catalyst in sparking that change, particularly given its proximity to Metro, VRE, the water park, and, and its location really in the heart of the development area of Crystal City. On the next slide is uh, an existing and proposed view of the block, the existing on the left, the proposed on, on the right-hand side. As you can see on that existing shot, there are some serious gaps on this block, uh, most notably along 18th Street, uh, where that large loop road is, and then along Crystal Drive between the two office buildings. It leads to, to some dead zones, uh, and it really makes uh, for kind of a difficult and isolated pedestrian experience, uh, and we think it makes it difficult to create the kind of critical mass that we want to have in, in a great urban space. So on the right side is our proposed condition. Um, I should point out that, as I mentioned, there are two separate applications that will be coming forward. That on the left uh, within the dotted line is going to be in a subsequent application. That includes a corner retail building uh, along 18th Street, some open space, and a conversion of an existing office building to residential. So put that aside. Obviously, this is going to operate as a single project, but that's going to be in a, in a later submission. The items before you this evening with this submission are on the right side, and they include uh, a theater building. That is the kind of square uh, box being dropped down there that covers up that large gap. That's going to be an Alamo Draft House theater, kind of a boutique specialty uh, movie theater that we're very excited about. And then adjacent to it uh, is going to be a low-rise grocer kind of bump out from the existing building, as well as some uh, additional retail that's going to be turned uh, to face Crystal Drive uh, a little more. So then um, the next slide, you can see the plan view. This is, again, the existing block. You can really see those gaps. They're even a little more pronounced there uh, along 18th Street and along Crystal Drive. One of the things you can't really see is, is a real grade difficulty from South Bell Street uh, dropping down to Crystal Drive. There is a significant grade change that really creates a, a pretty difficult physical condition for this block. Uh, the other physical challenges are a little more obvious. You can see that the internal road network is a, is a fairly confusing series of loop roads, uh, both along 18th Street and 15th Street. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, you can see this is the plan view of the proposed, uh, the proposed condition on the block. Again, on the left side, which is the south, those are the, the, the subject of the future application, the corner building at 18th and Crystal, the open space to the north of that corner building, and then the building marked 1770 Crystal Drive, JBG. That is all surrounded by the dotted line. That, again, will be in a future presentation, uh, but we think will work very well with uh, the, the proposal that we have before you here today. As you can see, we've got the theater uh, and 
1550 Crystal Drive. In front of that, there is the grocer building. Uh, a couple other things to point out. We are addressing that significant grade change uh, in the area between the corner building and 1770 with a monumental stair that we think is going to really help to connect uh, the grade, the ground level at Crystal Drive with, with the plaza level above it. Should also point out that the loading and parking on 18th Street and 15th Street are significantly simplified uh, compared to what you saw in the prior slide. The loading for the proposed grocery store is also going to be in that 15th Street area. Uh, finally, the changes are going to really enhance the pedestrian experience considerably. We've added a couple of crosswalks across Crystal Drive. And as you can see, the, the buildings are slightly pulled back from Crystal, uh, from Crystal Drive compared to what they are in the current condition, which is, if you've been down, there's not a, not a great uh, walking condition. Um, so it, the, the last thing I'd point out is that uh, there are some, also some significant entrances to the underground. So if you take a look at the next slide, um, this shows what the underground network looks like. This is an important part uh, of Crystal City and an important part of con pedestrian connections uh, through and, and within this block. You can also get a better look at the loading here on this level at 18th and uh, 15th. So on the next slide, uh, is some information about the, uh, the transit options here. This is a really well-served site. You can see within this one-mile radius, we've got about a dozen bus stops, two metro stations, uh, and, uh, and several bike share stations. The next slide will give you a little more granular level uh, of the transit near this site. Uh, you can see, again, there are multiple local and regional bus lines. There is a transit way um, and the existing metro station. So the next slide uh, gives you a little more information on the bicycle facilities. Uh, it's pretty well served today. We're also proposing uh, some, some new bike lanes on 15th Street and South Clark uh, and has great connections also to the, uh, the county's bicycle network. The next slide. Uh, talks about the pedestrian connections. Uh, we, we have a fairly good environment through a lot of Crystal City, but there are a couple pinch points. There are a couple of narrow areas here that uh, we're going to address uh, through the proposed development. Next slide. Uh, these are the, uh, the sector plan recommended and proposed streets. We are, we are pretty much in the same uh, location as the, as the recommendations. We have tried to neck down the lanes a little bit on Crystal Drive to make an easier crossing for pedestrians. So that's the Crystal Drive uh, section, and then the next slide will show you the 15th Street connection. Uh, if you move to the next slide, uh, some information, uh, I won't belabor this, but uh, the bus it, bus facilities here are pretty heavily used. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide here. Uh, our, our, our trip generation, uh, we, we assumed 50-50 mode splits, which is done typically throughout Crystal City. Uh, and and uh, we've looked at both the pedestrian and multimodal use uh, of transit in this site. Uh, next slide, please. So we did our, our TIA, and in that, uh, we found out of the 20 intersections we studied, only three of them uh, were impacted by the proposed development. It just so happens that these three intersections are all physically on JBG Smith private property, uh, so we're very heavily incentivized to, to uh, mitigate these, these circumstances. Um, th and we do believe that the uh, signal optimization is, is going to really be helpful uh, in mitigating these conditions. Next slide. Uh, we're going to pr be providing the standard TDM suite, which you all have seen many times. Next slide. Uh, this is just a, a loading slide. I won't spend any time on it. It shows you the loading pattern into the, into the grocer uh, along 15th Street. And so the next slide uh, provides some of the information about the transportation recommendations that uh, we believe we're meeting here, uh, supporting the multimodal system, expanding county control over streets. I should mention there are really significant street dedications associated with this project. If you, I'm sure you all are aware, majority of Crystal Drive and the other uh, streets within Crystal City are actually privately owned with easements. We're making fee dedications uh, with a lot of those areas. And uh, next slide is the end. Thank you so much. We'll be available for questions. Thank you. Does staff have anything to add to this? Uh, again, my name is Joanne Gabor with DES. Uh, I will leave it up to the chairman. I have a short presentation if you would like to see it. Um, due to time, if you would not, that is perfectly fine as well. Are there any particular highlights that you feel the applicant didn't cover? Um, I, will, I will show you one slide. All right. So I can, I can feel I did my job. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, next steps are there's SPRC2 on November 20th, <laughs> SPR3 on December 14th, 
um, and we are continuing to coordinate with uh, the applicant on the county project, which was the Clark Bell extension to 15th Street South from 12th Street South to 18th Street South and 15th Street South. That is the official name of it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Other commission questions quickly before we run out of time this evening? Uh, can you just speak to uh, the, the delighted to see some of the new crosswalks across Crystal Drive? Um, do they by any, does, do any of them by any chance line up with the Mount Vernon Trail Crystal City connector? So before the applicant adds that, we're actually still, <laughs> uh, we're still in the process of discussing the crosswalk locations across Crystal Drive. Um, this is, uh, I know it's a little small, but this right here is the existing crosswalk that's signalized today. Um, this is the VRE and the loading entrance for the apartments. Um, they are proposing one at this location. Um, you know, generally from a staff opinion, it's a bit too close to the other crossings. So we're a little weary of having the two crossings. Um, and so you know, our sort of conceptually, we're thinking just one between this area would be most appropriate. But again, that's still being discussed with the applicant about where that would be. Yeah, I would just point out, we have heard multiple times from the neighborhood on multiple occasions, and it's my experience as well, that um, we have a real, prob a real bike and pedestrian conflict problem between, is that 18th Street? Yes, 18th end? is on the southern end. Between 18th Street and the Crystal City connector, that there's a lot of bike traffic coming out of there trying to go south, and because of where the transit way stop has been placed, there is not a lot of sidewalk to share. Um, and so, to any extent, if we can relieve that problem by giving people an option of crossing the street there and being able to proceed south in a bike lane rather than uh, on a sidewalk, um, and also you know relieving some of the strain that is on that 18th Street Crystal Drive crossing, uh, I think that would go a long way to easing a long-standing neighborhood concern pretty much ever since the transit way was built. Understood. Anything else? Awesome. We will see you at SPRC. Very quickly, our next meeting is uh, November 30th. This is our actually our December meeting and our last meeting of the year. So uh, one more. Till next year. And that's all staff has for this evening. Awesome. Uh, two quick things. Very, 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 very briefly. Um, one, we need an SPRC rep to that site plan that we just saw. <laughs> um, if anyone is interested, please let me know. Um, also, um, Commissioner um, Perez uh, sends his kind regards. He unfortunately is closing on a house in Alexandria and is no longer able to be on Transportation Commission. Um, so. I Unfortunately, since he was out of town tonight, uh, his last meeting as a transportation commissioner has already passed. Um, so if you have thoughts on other people we should be inviting, uh, seeking out, uh, we do have two open spaces at this time on the commission. So please let me know on that. And I will put one more plug in that we still desperately need a liaison to the Neighborhood Complete Streets Commission, and I continue to be bugged about the fact that we don't have one. Neighborhood Complete Streets. It is a, a neat little, it's the thing that came after the Neighborhood Traffic Calming Commission. Um, it is doing targeted, um, for instance, they have, some money. they have some money to do pedestrian and bike and whatnot improvements on residential neighborhood streets, not arterials, not the big commercial ones. Fixing the targeted little issues where people live. Their, their charter requires them to have a TC rep, and we have not appointed them one. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. I will send you details. Anything else for the good of the commission? All right. We are adjourned. Thank you. Good evening.